Okay, hey, welcome back here, both uh, online and in person. Uh, let's start, uh, I'll call it the next set of uh, chapters. Although I will point out, I hopefully you see how the last chapter leads to this one. We're about to stop start optics. And so we've got three chapters on, on, on optics, and that will be our goal this week, to finish up those uh, three. Um, and uh, here is the, the title, if you will, of the first one. It's called Geometric Optics. In fact, these first two chapters are on geometric optics. I would say this chapter is about the physics behind behind geometric optics, and the next chapter is about useful practical applications of the geometric optics. And then the next chapter after that we get into wave optics. And so as you know we just finished up a chapter discussing that one type of an electromagnetic wave is our visible light. So don't forget that, but we're going to put the, the wave nature of light kind of on a back burner right now. And we're going to look at these next two chapters really without talking about light as being a wave. We will say it's a ray. And so that's kind of the early scientists first start. So that's where we'll start, even though it's kind of a back step for us because we just learned that they were waves. We'll see that in a lot of circumstances, you don't need to know that they're waves. You just need to know that they travel in a straight line and therefore they're rays. And so that's what we'll do the first two chapters. But rest assured they are waves and rest assured we're going to have to remember that in chapter let's see 20 by 20 it must be 27 where we do wave optics all right so i'm going to put on the board here chapter 25 okay here's 25 and i'll just put the the title here geometric optics and so well what is geometric optics and so your author starts off, kind of a fun picture, I kind of like this because this looks to me, I'm going to guess here, I, I looked at the caption and it didn't say that this was a mirror off the new James Webb telescope, but given that it just, uh, just NASA just released their, the first pictures, it's kind of exciting, but that's exactly what they look like. They're hexagon, they will look kind of uh, gold in color because they are actually uh, reflective in the gold. They actually put gold on them uh, purposely because they don't reflect blue very well. And so you can see here's the original. You can see the blues kind of gone in the reflections. And so you you know you're reflecting off of something that reflects reds really well and infrared. And of course that telescope is designed to see in the infrared and the far infrared and the, the red visible but not so much in the in the blue. Anyways, so I'm sure that that's what it is, but here is the kind of the outline of it. It's not a very long chapter, it's not really a short one either, it's got seven sections, so we'll see how far we get in this first hour, and hopefully we'll get significantly in, we'll get about halfway. Um, got a couple other pictures here, but I just want to start right here, kind of a boring and obvious, but it just says, you can think of light as traveling in a, in a straight line. I'm going to go back to those laser pointers that uh, we had, and I was showing you in the last chapter, uh, maybe I'll pick the green one here in the middle of the spectrum. Actually, maybe I'll do the green and the red, so I'll kind of shine them here on the on the whiteboard. And of course, what we were saying in the, the last chapter is these would be electromagnetic waves, and the green one would be at a higher frequency than the red one, but they would come in here. Those waves would then bounce off. They would go into your eye. Your eye would register it, and that way your brain would say, hey, one's higher, so it's green. The other one's lower, so it's red. All right, but that aside, I want you to see, and what this picture is trying to say, is they pretty much travel in a straight line. And so we're going to say that these waves, we won't even call them waves for a while. Let's just call them rays. We'll just say that the electromagnetic field, even though there's both of them and one makes another, we don't even have to look at that much detail. We could just say that the energy goes in this straight line. And that's what your author is trying to say here. Your author is trying to say, look, here comes some sunlight. Uh, he's got a ray. He, I don't even think he's trying to indicate what color it is, whether it's red or green or blue or orange. He's just saying, look, it goes straight. Of course, then it bounces off, but after it bounces off, then it goes straight to you. And so we've got this lady here looking at a car. So the sunlight comes in and bounces off the car and they, they see the light from the car. Uh, for you guys, I thought I would go ahead and try to make it semi-dark in here and see if we can actually then see uh, the rays. And this is probably dark enough. Maybe I'll do one more over here on this screen since I'll kind of be pointing in in this direction. 
Uh, now I'll do one more here. Be, we'll close this door here. But if I shine it across the room, and I'll just kind of shine it on the wall over there. Uh, now that it's so dark, it'll look so much brighter, but we got a red one and a green one. But I want you to kind of realize that the energy is going from in my hand over to that wall, then bouncing on the wall and going to your eyes. And so right here, I'll turn it off for now, but right in the middle, there's actually energy, but it's going not to your eyes, but towards the wall. And so you don't see it. However, if I put a little smoke in the room, and so I've got this canister that I can just kind of fill up the room with smoke and say, okay, there is my green light. There's my red one. Mm -hmm. And so if nothing else, you can kind of see that they do travel in a straight line. It's just, of course, you don't see it. And this is going to be important when we talk about mirrors and lenses later on. You don't see it till the light goes to you. And so what it needs to do in this case is hit something. And that's what the advantage of the smoke is. It hits the smoke and then bounces off and goes towards you. Oh, kind of like a crossing. A little lightsaber game here. We'll have a battle of lightsabers. <laughs> All right. Well, they don't really bounce off each other. They just cut right through each other. It's the superpositioning of waves. And so we said that with sound waves. We'll say that with light waves. But starting off the first section, like I said, isn't necessarily the most exciting section. It just says, hey, light travels in a straight line. Let's call them rays for now. Keep that in mind. It doesn't matter if it's red or green or blue or orange or purple, whatever. Well, there's no purple. Uh, but there is a straight line travel to it. All right. So that, I would say, is section one. But where we really get in to starting working with rays is 5.2. We will see that there's two laws of geometric optics. And the first one is called the law of reflection. It simply asks this question. If you have a reflective material, I'll call it a mirror, and you send a ray of light, and again, notice I'm drawing a straight line. Notice I'm not really saying what color it is, what wavelength it is, what frequency it is. But when it hits the mirror, what happens? And your author's first picture, and I'll demonstrate with what we call our whiteboard optics, your author says it's, it's going to bounce. It's going to be reflect. Um, and so he calls this in his picture right here the incident ray. And uh, notice then we will measure the incident ray between the ray and the normal. And let me emphasize that. Because you might think that we could measure the angle between the ray and the mirror. We don't. Uh, when we get to the second law, you'll see why this is a better option. But when we're dealing with reflection, it, you don't really see it. But I would just want to point out that our definition of the angle of incidence is between the normal, so perpendicular to the mirror, and the ray. So in my case, to demonstrate it, I'm going to take my little set of laser beams right here. So I got this little plug-in box here. I can maybe get you to see it a little better if I turn off the lights to the whiteboard. Uh, but hopefully you can see these five laser beams. Uh, they're designed to actually spread a little so that they'll actually kind of reflect off of and you can kind of see them. Uh, for us, I think I'll just kind of starters here, kind of block all but one of them. So maybe I'll just kind of put that right there and say, let me just block them so I can look at one beam. All right, so here's this one laser beam. And what would happen when it hit some kind of reflecting surface? And so, somewhere in here, I have ah, a polished surface. I hope you guys on camera can see, but I got what you might call a small little piece of a mirror. 
Uh, right here's a little magnet so it can stick to the to the whiteboard so the laser beam is going to hit the the mirror so i'm just going to take it and maybe give a little angle to my mirror like that and of course hopefully you see something you really already know the the light reflects sure enough oh you can't see it when the are off ah all right Oh, which which off the the room lights? No, oh, okay. It's on the camera too. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, and actually, uh, that is actually a lot better. I thought it would get darker in here, but with all that light in there. All right, so, but what I want to do then is, you know, as I started to do over here, let me draw the normal. And so the normal is perpendicular to the surface, so perpendicular to the mirror. Well, we've used that name a couple of times. Obviously, we used it most recently with our electromagnetics, but we also used it with forces in physics 110. Um, but this right here is what I would call the incident angle. Okay. And hopefully, it begins to look obvious to you that then this reflected angle, let me just check your author, does he use a little f? Uh, I'm sorry, R, yeah, so use a little R. He calls this then the reflected angle. And I'll draw that first one kind of in a blue color, but uh, maybe I'll switch to red for a second. No, oh, my laser beam's red. I'll switch to green. Because if I were to change the angle of incidence, so let me kind of rotate my mirror a little bit, maybe right there. And I'll draw the normal now. Since I moved the mirror, the normal moved. Okay. So let me draw perpendicular. So this is the new normal. And I guess then this right here would be the new angle of incidence. So notice it increased because I rotated my mirror in you know, a direction. I could have increased it or decreased it. But did you also notice that the angle of reflection increased? In fact, don't those two look about equal? And that is called the law of reflection. The law of reflection just simply says that whatever angle the light comes in at, the angle of incidence, equals the angle of reflection. So I think of all the laws of physics we've done this semester and the ones we are about to do, this might be the easiest. <laughs> it just is simply one equals the other. And it's a lot easier than the second law of geometric optics we're about to do. And so this is a good place to start. It just says the angle coming in equals the angle going out. Angle of incident equals the angle of reflection. And that's called the law of reflection. And in fact, we are going to do a lab where what you will do is you will measure the angle coming in and the angle going out. You'll do like 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and by the time you do a bunch of angles, you'll convince yourself exactly what I'm trying to say here, is that the angle coming in equals the angle going out. Law of reflection. Uh, I'll call it fact number one. All right, uh, And that's again what your author is trying to show, if I turn on the, the room lights, He's trying to show in figure four here. He said, look, if you have this nice, smooth, polished surface, the incident ray, the angle between the normal, I want to emphasize that, it's measured from the normal, so between the ray and the normal, that angle coming in is equal to the angle going out. Now, if you have a surface that is not smooth, that, in a way, is good if you want a bunch of people to see that light because on a microscopic scale the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection for that ray so that ray goes off in that direction and so somebody standing over there would actually get a ray going to their eyes and then they could say hey I, I, I see the light coming from that object uh, but this one here kind of almost goes back to the observer so again the observer would see the light 
and then this one would bounce off over to that direction. And so by having a kind of rough surface, but not too rough, so one that reflects a lot but is uneven, means it sends it in all directions. And I don't know if you even recognize that, but that's exactly what is happening right here on this whiteboard. When this dot hits, going there, it all goes in that direction. Nobody sees the light midair unless you put something in there to reflect it and make it go back to people's eyes. But this whiteboard, even though it may feel nice and smooth, is actually called a diffuse reflector. And so this is our diffuse reflector, and it sends the light in all kinds of directions. And so when I shine it on here, some of the light goes to everybody's eyes here in the room, and everybody in the room sees it, including me, and some of it goes into the camera lens, and so the people on the other end, or the camera records it, so people can see the little green dot. But every little microscopic point is following the law of reflection. That's the important point. And that's kind of what this is saying. Here's one person's eye, here's another eye, here's another eye. So the flashlight comes in and goes in a diffuse reflection. And so you don't usually want a smooth surface for something like a whiteboard. In fact, this is what he's trying to say here in figure seven. He said, if you had a nice mirror that was nice and smooth, the light would come in, it would reflect, and it would all go to this person. And this person would see a bright light. <laughs> But sadly, this person wouldn't see anything. This says, oh, no, the light came to me. You didn't shine the light to me. And so when you want a nice, smooth surface is different from when you, you don't. There's uh, the surface of a, a, a lake or an ocean or something here, kind of showing the, the same thing. Ah, but this will give us a chance then to talk about our first application, and that is just what we call a regular flat mirror. A nice piece of glass that reflects really nice. It obeys the law of reflection. Uh, this person standing in front of the mirror. You can ask a couple of questions like, if this person stands in front of the mirror, do they see an image of themselves? If they do, how tall is that image? And where is that image? Does that image appear to be like on the surface of the mirror, like a painting? Or does it appear to be inside the mirror, behind the mirror, like a window? Well, I can answer all those with the law of reflection. And I think you're kind of seeing the author say, okay, here's the object and here's the image. Uh, we call it an image because somebody looking at the light reflecting off the mirror would get the appearance of them coming from there. But it didn't really come from there. Oh, let me draw a couple of pictures. Let me take advantage of this law of reflection and let me look at what we call a flat mirror. It's a flat mirror because it's a plane. The light bounces off a flat surface. I want to keep emphasizing that because this is the most common mirror, the one you're used to. I would also call it the most boring mirror. Because when they're curved, we can do more interesting and creative things, and we can magnify things, we can make them look closer, we can build things like telescopes and microscopes, we can uh, kind of understand corrective vision, we can understand how the human eye works and how the human eye makes mistakes and so needs corrective vision. And so all these curved surfaces um, are important and far more interesting than this beginning case. But the beginning case is, is where we'll start here. So I'm going to say, let's kind of analyze a flat mirror. I'll just make a real tall flat mirror. And that's a little different than your author's picture. Your author is kind of asking a very important question. Not only is where is the image, not only how tall is the image, but how big does a flat mirror need to be in order you, for you to see your whole image? So if you're getting ready in the morning and you want to see everything from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, do you need a mirror that's as tall as you? Taller than you? Shorter than you? If it's shorter, how much shorter? Well, let's see if we can answer all of those questions. 
and I would say because the light is reflecting the only thing we need to know is the law of reflection this is a good chance for me to say we're going to do a lot of fun things but just like that long chapter on 23 it was all Faraday's law and a bunch of applications this is all the law of reflection and a bunch of applications so physics is about knowing how to apply a few fundamental principles to explain a universe and so everything about optics we can explain here just like everything of our electromagnetic stuff we can kind of explain with four different principles here we can explain all of our optics with two principles this being the first one reflection next one is refraction by the way all right so I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna draw what we'll call the object now I won't be as fancy and try to draw a human but I'll just draw something that has a dimension of vertical size so I can kind of ask is it taller is the image taller is the image shorter something like that uh, maybe I'll put an arrow pointing up so I could also ask myself does the image turn upside down so not only where is the image is it taller is it smaller is it closer is it further you know where is it positioned how big is the mirror all of these are great questions that really based upon geometry and so like most of our problems here we're going to rely on math to answer this this question uh, this time we're going to focus a lot on geometry so let's talk about again if I just kind of put here here's my object and I begin to ask a question of well how do I see an object well let me step away from that one for for just a moment let me draw something a little bit simpler and kind of build up to that one let's just say that I had a mirror and I, I'll put the mirror here but I'm not even gonna forget about the mirror for just a second and I'm gonna say I just have a little tiny object and for whatever reason I'm kind of thinking this is somebody getting ready in the morning so maybe this small object is like the cap of my toothpaste all right so I take the cap off and I put it on the counter and I'm looking at this cap all right and so here's kind of a top-down view and so I've got like my eye number one and my eye number two we're looking down I got an ear here and an ear here and uh, kind of a bald head here okay so there I am you're looking down and I'm not even looking into the mirror I, I, I'm, I'm just gonna look at the cap what I want you to understand is what we call binocular vision why do we have two eyes why do all predators have two eyes close together and prey has eyes further apart well it's called three-dimensional vision when you get your eyes that each eye can see the same thing in, in our case I'll, uh, I'll do this electroscope I got this electroscope here and what happens here is the light comes from the electroscope and goes in my left eye and other rays of light go into my right eye and this left eye sees a little different angle than this right eye and my brain takes those two images and kind of overlaps them and my brain kind of figures out where the light must have come from in order to overlap so if I'm looking at this little cap I would say well one ray goes into my left eye and one ray goes into my right eye and depending on that angle my eyes then know my depth how how far away is that see see watch what happens um, I'll change to green and say what if the cap of my toothpaste was a little closer let's say it was here so I would have one ray going into my left eye and one ray going to my right eye and and see that angle would be a little closer my, my eyes would be angled in 
And so my brain has learned, and if you've ever watched a developing child, you'll see that they don't have any depth perception at first. They're just, you know, they're laying in the crib looking up and there's the floating mobile above their head. And if they're old enough to maybe reach up, they'll, they'll reach for it, despite the fact that it's up on the ceiling. They have no clue how far away it is. Even kids start getting into kindergarten and first grade and they get on a sports team, you'll, you'll see it. A little leaguer will stand in the outfield and see the baseball and just go, uh, oh yeah. And they just have no idea of depth of perception. It, it just really hasn't registered. Uh, even when you go for your driver's license test, they do a depth perception. They make you look in the little machine and say, all right, is it safe to make a left-hand turn in front of this car? You know, you need to know how far away that car is. And so part of the depth perception or part of the testing is your depth perception. Anyways, I want you to kind of understand then that your brain needs these two eyes to get a depth perception. Well, I'll draw another one. I'll, maybe I'll do it here in orange. What if the cap was further away? So the cap is way over here. And again, you will see that the light going to my left eye and the right going to my right eye is at a different angle. And so you might say the more my, my eyes have to tilt in, the closer the object is. So if I stand here and I look at that electroscope and I compare it to that cup of coffee and I compare it to that fire extinguisher, the angle of my eyes tell me that that electroscope, uh, Vandy graph, sorry, what do I call it electroscope? That Vandy graph is closer to me than that cup of coffee. And each of these are closer than that fire extinguisher by that back door. And so that's our depth perception. And so you guys probably do that a lot in your life science. That's why you know things like uh, cheetah. You know, they got all your cats, you know, they got their eyes right in front. Those eyes, both eyes overlap. They've got a good idea which antelope is closer, which one is further, how fast they're moving. I mean, they've got that all figured out. Uh, uh, take a bird, uh, maybe a sparrow. Uh, their eyes are really far apart. Now, the good thing about this is this eye can see all the way over to here, and this eye can see all the way over to here. And so as a prey, I've got a lot of vision. I don't have to turn my head to see. I, I can see you coming up on this side. I'm looking that way, but I see this. And the only overlap I have is directly in front of me because I do like to eat spiders too. And so I've got a narrow window where I can get three-dimensional view and I can pick off a spider. But on the other hand, I've got a wide angle view that I can figure out when my prey is coming after me. And so predator or prey kind of is detected by your, your eyesight and, you know, what, what, what are you using your eyes for? All right, and I didn't mean to get too far into the whole predator, prey, life science part of that, but I think that's something that you guys can relate to. That's something you, I'm sure you talk about in your biology classes here. I just want you to realize that I need to understand that I need to look at two rays. One going to my left eye and one going to my right eye to figure out where something appears to be. I also want you to get you to realize that when we look at something, we kind of imply in our brain that the light came in straight lines to us. We stand here and we look at this Vandy graph and we go, the light came right here. The light came right here. We don't look here and go, oh, it's, it's over there because what happened is the light came and made a curve and get into my eyes. And because it made a curve, I'm looking this way when I see it, but I know it's really over there. We, we never do that. We know the light's going to travel in a straight line. And that's important when I ask this question. When the light doesn't go in a straight line, when we reflect the light or refract the light, what's that going to do to our brain? Well, our brain's going to think the light came from somewhere else, and that's what we call an image.
So if I come back over here, and let me erase the green one and the orange one. And so somebody who's in the bathroom getting ready in the morning might actually look down on the counter and say, well, there's the cap. But they also might see the light after it bounces off the mirror. They might see this. And so they look at the actual cap and they go, oh, there's the object. The object is actually on the countertop. But as they look into the mirror, they also see a cap. Now, if it's a human, a human is smart enough to know there's not really a cap. What happened is the light hit the mirror, bounced off according to the law of reflection, and went to their eyes. But if you don't notice that, and you really think the light came from there, your brain is going to project back and say, where did that light initiate from? And your brain's going to say something like this. And so I'm going to put some dotted lines here to kind of indicate where the light would have come from if it had gone in a straight line, if it had not reflected off the mirror. And so this is what we're going to call an image. And that's why when you stand there in front of the mirror, you can either look directly at the cap and see it, or you can look into the mirror and say, well, there is, and again, nobody's this dumb to say there's another cap inside of the mirror, but you would say there is an image of the cap. And your brain would process it as if the light had come from this spot that is inside of the mirror. So it's more like a window. And that's what your author is trying to show you in this picture, is this person looks in, and when they see their own image, they, they, they have this perception of somebody not at the mirror themselves, but behind the mirror. Like they're on the other side of a window. Not that they're a painting at that location. They're actually inside. So again, what we're going to do is we are going to call things objects and images. Images are where the light is going to not really initiated from. It just has that appearance because the light was redirected by either reflection or refraction. So in this case, it's reflection. That's where we're going to, as far as we're going to get today. And so there's our idea of, a, of an image. But I'll say it again. Notice how you have to have two rays. You have to kind of think about the one that goes to your left eye and the one that goes to your right eye. And you kind of have to think back and trace back to where it comes from. Because when we get to harder things, that's exactly the, the process we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go. We're going to say, well, where would the light appear to be coming from after it reflected or after it refracted? And that's where the image would be. All right. So if that made sense, I'm going to do a little geometry here. And I'm going to ask this question, where, where is this image compared to the object? Now, I tried to argue that it would not be on the surface of the mirror. That it's going to be back inside the surface of the mirror. So, so why don't I call this the object, the distance of the object, d sub o. And why don't I call this the distance of the image. Uh, how far back is it? And you look like you're raising your hand. You're gonna, I think you were going to say something. You were going to say... And it does come out to be equal. And let's go through the first case. The easy case. This will set us up for the harder cases. And so if it'll be okay with you, let me clear off what I've drawn so far. 
and I'll just not worry about the human anymore. I'll go back to my mirror here. Well, that's not a very good vertical line. Let me draw a vertical line. So here's my mirror. And again, for simplicity, I'll just put a little cap. Now remember, I'm trying to ask a bigger question, something that has size to it. But right now, I just want to take kind of a point object. Because I claim if you can figure out what it is for a point, then a big object is just a bunch of those points put together. Okay. So, let's say somebody is over here looking at the light that is reflected. And we just have to figure out where the light would appear to come from, from somebody, for somebody who's over here. And let me do the easy ones. I'll do this. Let's look at a ray that I'll call straight towards the mirror. Now, maybe we better come back to this picture and ask, what would the angle of incidence be for this ray? And let me emphasize again, it's measured from the normal. So the angle would be? It's zero. Tempted to say 90, I know. But where's the normal? I'll draw the normal in green. There's the normal. And so the incident ray is between the normal and the ray. It's not between the ray and the mirror. Between the ray and the mirror is 90 degrees. That's true. But that's not the definition of an incident or ray. So this one that goes straight in, goes straight like this down the normal, the angle is zero. So here I'm going to say the angle of incidence is zero. So what's the angle of reflection? Zero. So it'll just bounce straight back and kind of head off in that direction. So let's say this is the ray that goes into my left eye. Okay. I'm not quite done because I need an, another ray. I need a ray that goes into my right eye. So let me do this one. Let me just do kind of one that is angled down. All right. What's the angle of incident here? And I don't mean give me a number because obviously it's not zero and it's not 90. But I just want to make sure you see it. So if I draw a normal, so here is a green dotted line. This right here is the angle of incidence. I'll say it again because it's easy to get these backwards here at the beginning. The angle of incidence is between the normal and the ray. All right. So where would this light go when it reflects? And let me just pause. Notice I'm answering all these questions with the law of reflection. Well, we said that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So the reflected ray would probably look something like that. So that the angle of incident and the angle of reflection are the same. So let's say this is the ray going into my right eye. All right, so, so here's the one going to my left eye. Here's the one going to my right eye. Where would my brain then process where the light is coming from? So I guess it would take this ray and say, well, it's coming from back here somewhere. All right, where's this ray coming from? Well, back here somewhere. And so my brain would say they have the appearance of coming from right here. So there's the image. And so again, I have the object, I have the image, the distance that the object is from the mirror, it's called the object distance. Now notice it's from the mirror to the object. It's not from object to image. Right? It's not from object to observer. It's from object to mirror. All right? So I'm going to call that the object distance. And then the likewise, what is the image distance is my, my question. 
And you actually did already tell me the obvious answer. It's the same distance. All right, and I just want to prove that. Uh, but like I said, we got to go through the law of reflection here. And again, I'll point out that notice how the image distance is defined from the image to the mirror. Not the image to the object, not the image to the observer. Image to the mirror. Okay, and so those are our beginning parts of this chapter. What are the definition of these things? Now, here's where we're going to do a little math. Actually, geometry is probably more the correct word here. Uh, maybe I'll change to kind of a, a red here. If this is the angle of incident, then I would claim that that angle is also the angle of incidence. Because I have two normals, they're parallel. I have a transit that cuts them, and those are what we call alternate interior angles from geometry. Alternate interior angles are equal. Okay. Uh, moving along, I guess I would call this angle all the reflected angle. Because here I have a normal and then this line, when two lines cross each other, the, the angles on opposite side, called vertical angles, are equal. So I'm going to use geometry and say those are equal. Now, of course, the law of reflection says these two are equal because the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are the same. I'm going to use that parallel one again, alternate interior angles, and say, well, this would equal to the angle of reflection right there. See, because those are alternate interior. Ah, and so let me look at a blue triangle. So I'll call this the blue triangle right here. And then I'll look at an orange triangle. And you might ask about this blue and orange triangle. Is there any mathematical connection between those two? And I would say there is. Uh, I guess I would point out, since these are a normal, that these would each be right angles. We, all, we just said those were equal. That would mean these angles here are equal, right? Because we know all three angles add up to 180 degrees. There's some more nice geometry. So if two of the angles match, the third one have to match, because all three of them add up to 180 degrees. And so I would say I have just shown that the blue and the orange triangle have the same angles. And when things have the same shape, we call them similar triangles. But if they have the same shape and the same length, we call them congruent triangles. And I would say, since the blue and the orange share the same leg here, they have at least one leg that's the same side. Again, you might remember from geometry, if you showed what we call angle side angle, if you can show a corresponding angle, a side and an angle are equal, then all six things have to be equal. All three angles and all three sides. So I would say we've done exactly what we need to show we have congruent triangles. We have an angle side angle. And what I'm trying to get at is that's my proof that this length is that length. So, took a little math, a little geometry, maybe to prove the obvious, that the angle of the object, or the, excuse me, the distance of the object and the distance of the image are the same. All right. So, now we can kind of come to the grand finale here. All right. Oh. Ron. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, we, which way were you pointing? Were you pointing at the camera? Uh, you got that? Okay. okay. All right. So, now here's what I'm going to try to say. If I were to look at all the light coming from the top of the arrowhead, and without drawing all those rays and just say there's somebody over here watching the rays, I would say that this person is seeing the arrowhead straight across and the depth 
into the mirror. That is, the image distance is the same as the object distance. If I were to do the same thinking about the middle per part of the object, so the middle of the mirror or the waist of this person standing there, I would say the light would appear to be coming from right there, straight across. Uh, if I were to look at the light coming from the feet of that person, this person would see it, the feet as being right here, and the knees being right here, and the torso being right here. I, I think you get the idea that what this person would see is exactly the same size. And so if I call this the height of the object, then this would become the height of the image. And so I would say that not only can I use this law of reflection to figure out where the image is, it's the same distance into the mirror that the object is in front of the mirror, but I could use this to argue that the image is exactly the same height. You might say this is not increased or reduced in magnification. You might even say the magnification is 1. Or whatever the height of the object is, you multiply by 1 and that's the height of the image. So it's not bigger, it's not small, and it's not inverted. But as you'll see, we're going to make some more creative mirrors, and we're going to make things bigger and smaller and upside down, right side up. And so the simple case is we are right side up. Okay. Now, another question here was the size of the mirror. And in this case, the person's looking at themselves. And so maybe I'll take away the secondary observer and say, okay, let's look at the light coming to these per this person's eyes. Now, I know the eyes aren't at the top of the head. In fact, your author does a better job and says, well, we'll get a little bit of depth or we'll drop the eyes a little bit below the head. And so your author says that the light coming from the top of the head would hit the mirror and bounce off and go to their eyes. And so it would look something like this if their eyes were a little bit below the top, maybe right here. You would have to have the light hit a little bit below a point on the mirror that's a little bit below the height of the person. And in fact, because the angle of incidence is angles of reflection, if there's four inches between the top of my head and the eye, the light would hit two inches down. And the same thing with your feet. The feet would come up and hit near the midway point, maybe a little higher. In fact, if your eyes were exactly at the top of your head and your feet at the bottom, this would, light would actually hit halfway up the height of the mirror. And the point being is the only usefulness part of the mirror is half the size of the person. And so we can answer this question, how big does this mirror need to be? Well, it needs to be half the size of the person. A mirror that's half the size of the person could see the whole person. Of course, only if it was positioned just perfect. And since people have different heights, most people, when they buy what they call a full-length mirror and they mount it on their bathroom wall or their door, it's about three-quarters the size of a person. And that way, you know, somebody who's a little taller, a little shorter, uses half the height, but there's some variation in half their, their height. Right, and notice that wouldn't change. I mean, if I got closer to the mirror, yeah, so I put somebody right here, the light's still going to go off and hit like that. <laughs> the angle's just steeper. Yeah, so no matter where this person stands, close to the mirror, far from the mirror, the height of that flat mirror 
is. Now, I hope I didn't take too long to do this first one and this easy one, and maybe the answers you already knew. But what I wanted to really get across is the CLEI answered this with one simple principle, the law of incidence, or the law of reflection, which says the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So if I curve it concave, if I curve it convex, it might make it bigger, it might make it smaller, it might make it inverted. I don't know, I just gotta do a bunch of geometry. A little geometry, a little math. 10 hours later, I can finish the problem. Right? And, and so that's what we're trying to get across here. All right. All right, well, like I said, that's the, the law of reflection. Now, the second one is a little harder. And we've got two minutes, so maybe we should stop it here for today and pick up on what's called the second law or the law of refraction tomorrow. All right, well, see you guys tomorrow. All right. <laughs> Hey, okay, welcome back. At least you guys in person, you guys online, I guess uh, we'll just splice it together and it'll look like one chapter. But as you know, we were working along in our first chapter of optics and we got to the first law of geometric optics, which is the law of reflection. And we almost wrapped it up. In fact, I was kind of thinking we did wrap it up, but I thought I'd do two more things uh, and then wrap it up and then go on to the second law. And so these are the two things. Uh, the first one you might remember of the law of reflection is I was talking about this, this image here. And we went through a lot of geometry. Um, and again, for you guys online, it was just a moment ago. Uh, but we talked about where would the image be? And, and hopefully what you got all out of that was that the image distance is the same as the object distance. And this was all based upon this angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. That's the, the first law of geometric optics, the law of reflection. Um, we also said it would be the same size, that is the image is the same size, we might say the magnification is one. We might even say a plus one because the image is upright, it's not inverted. And we'll see some cases where the, the mirrors and the lenses invert things, and so we'll talk about a negative magnification. So, that being said, I thought I would set it up here today. So, come over here. This is kind of fun to see. Um, I put a flat mirror here. Um, and, again, flat mirrors are very common, so you probably already used one today. But if I kind of, do I need to move this over for the lighting run? Okay. But what I want to do is kind of angle it back for you guys in the classroom and you guys online. And I, I'm hoping you can see that I put an object in front. Uh, the object is nothing fancy. It's, it's just this bench rod. It's just got a base and a rod that kind of sticks up real high so we can mount to things. Um, but behind that is a mirror. But I'm hoping you could also see the reflection of the object in the mirror. And so, not only do you see the object, but in the mirror, you see the image. But I did something even more than that. Uh, you'll notice that the mirror only goes this high. Well, let me spin it around, and you can see it better on the back side, because I have put another object an identical object that the rod sticks up above the mirror. And so to make sure you kind of perceive that depth perception, I'm hoping you can see there in the camera, if I get the angle right, that the bottom half of the image really is the image. But above this line, above the mirror, is actually a pole from a real object that's behind the mirror. And hopefully, as I move it back and forth, they look aligned. <coughs> uh, here's the best part, is you can really tell the alignment when I come over here and I grab what probably looks like an image to you, and I scoot it over a little bit. And as I scoot it over, you will now very clearly see how the top half is a real object, but the bottom half is still the reflection in the mirror, is still the image in the mirror. And again, hopefully that kind of registers a little better with you now, knowing that it would be some kind of depth perception. And so the image is inside of the mirror. And of course, sometimes they can even actually be in front of the mirror. Those are 
different kind of images that you're not as familiar with, but we're going to talk about here today. So that's the one thing. The other thing I wanted to do is I said, you know, I should probably do an example of using the law of reflection. And so let me get out my marker here. Let me put, okay, let's look at number two. Uh, let's apply this law of reflection and see how it works. Uh, and uh, so I guess page uh, 1142 is what I wrote down. There it is, problem number two. It simply says this. It says, show that when light reflects off of two mirrors that meet each other at a right angle. And so that's this picture right here. We've got two mirrors. There's a 90 degree angle between the two mirrors. The outgoing ray is parallel to the incoming ray. All right. So let's see if I can kind of draw this, this diagram here. Um, I will make my right angle by saying, okay, the first mirror I'll make kind of a vertical mirror. Then I'll make a horizontal mirror. You know, they've got theirs twisted a little bit, but they've got this ray coming in and it hits the mirror. And so if I draw a normal, it will then bounce off. And of course, the law of reflection says the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And if I understand your author's picture right, here's the one he has coming in. He, he has it hitting one, he might be the bottom mirror first, but he calls this theta one and theta one. All right, so I'll do that same pattern. So the one coming in is theta one and the one coming out is also theta one. So then it bounces down, hits the second mirror and bounces off of that. And again, if we draw a normal, this angle of incidence, which your author calls theta 2, so I will too, but using the law of reflection means that the reflected angle has to be a theta 2. And we're to show that the ray coming in and the ray going out are, are parallel. We often call this a corner reflector. You, uh, you're probably familiar with reflectors that are on bikes and on cars, uh, you know, usually like a tail light on a car has uh, a lens and uh, part of it is where the light comes out, say the brake lights or the turn signals, but above and below. If you look real closely, there's reflectors in there. They look like little corners of cubes uh, because this is how they're designed. They're designed so that if any light were to be shine on that tail light, it will be reflected back to the source, exactly parallel back to it. And so that way, another car with its headlights then catches part of your tail lights that reflects back. And they go, oh, hey, yeah, the, you know, or road signs is the same way. A little bit of light from your car then hits that road sign up of there, and the light all comes right back to the source of the, of the light. So, so we are to, to, to prove that. And so I'll go ahead and then, I guess, prove it. And uh, maybe I'll do something like uh, this. Um, I will say something to the effect that this whole angle right here would be 2 theta 1. Okay. Now, that being said, if we do again a little geometry, because this normal would be straight up, it means it's parallel to this mirror. That's part of the consequences of this being 90 degrees, because this is 90 degrees and that's 90 degrees. So these two are parallel. So I guess what I'm saying here is this right here would also be a theta 2. Oh, which of course would mean also this is a theta 2. And so I would say those two angles, making two theta two, makes up this full, I'll call it a half circle. So in other words, this is 180 degrees. Okay. Now to prove they're parallel, I've essentially done that because what I would say is this beam has then has this total, theta 1, theta 1, theta 2, theta 2, which is that, 
which I've drawn here as a half circle, but when I draw it on here, that means the total sum of this angle is 180 degrees, and that means it diverts by 180 degrees. That's what we mean by parallel. You come in, you divert a total of 180 degrees, meaning you're going right back in the same direction you came from. So that's not too complicated of a proof, but it is the whole idea of I've used the law of reflection and I use a little bit of, a little bit of geometry, and that's really kind of the point here of this problem in this chapter. All right, well, now let's begin with the next section. And the second law is a little bit harder. We call this the law of refraction. And most people know what reflection is. You can just say the word reflection and they've got it. But refraction is what? That's not quite as common as a word. So why don't I just say refraction then is the bending of light. The light actually bends a little bit. Now this is worth showing because I don't know if people always catch on to light actually bending. You can kind of see it if you put something in a glass of water. Oh, and I had a little ruler and then I was playing with it and I think I left it. Let me see if I can grab this stick right here. It's a little longer than I had hoped. But the idea here is you can hopefully see the stick is straight. There's no bend to the stick. But if I put it in the water, you will then see, I hope, and try it with this one. Can you see it, Ron? Does it look like there's a small deviation to it? If I do it close, you don't really see a deviation. If I hold it back, you can see a difference. It probably also looks magnified too because of the curve. And my point is being here that your brain still processes it as if light came to you in a straight line, but it did not. It had a bending to it. And it's because of that we can use lenses to control the light and get things to look bigger or get them to look smaller or get them to look closer or get them to look further. Now probably the best way I can show you the refraction is with one of these light beams again. So let me set this back up from yesterday here and I'll just put my five laser beams sticking off to the side. I'll power down the room light so you can see it better. Uh, let me like yesterday block four of the five, for the moment anyways. And so I just have one laser beam across the whiteboard. And let me just grab, oh, I'll use this. I don't know. Well, I'll use both. But uh, maybe I'll start with something geometrically simpler, uh, this rectangle, and I'll place the rectangle up there. And I hope what you see is refraction. You'll probably also see reflection also. Uh, let me point out both here. And so when we get here to the surface, if I draw a normal, the energy is coming in. So let me call that the angle of incidence. And then this is the angle of reflection. And so that's the one we've been working with. But I'm hoping you also see right here on this surface as it's going in, and I'll draw a normal, there is an angle of what we're going to call the angle of refraction. It has changed. And I hesitated for a second to write anything down because I want to use the same notation of your author. And I'm not as familiar with your author as my other book. And I think he uses just angle one and angle two. Yeah. Okay. And that's pretty 
common. So maybe I'll power back the chalkboard lights here or the whiteboard lights. And so when he does refraction, he changes the incident angle to uh, number one. Okay, so I'm going to say those are the same. But then he says this angle after it hits the surface is angle number two. Now, I want to be a little careful here in this diagram because there is actually refraction going on twice. And it's really easy for the students to misunderstand what I mean by angle number two. And so let me just outline my glass block and pull it away. Well, let me also make a little mark of where the light is going when the glass block is here. So when the glass block is here, I'll draw it in red, the red laser beam angled down to here, but then it bent again coming out, and you probably noticed it was parallel to the original beam. So when it comes out, it also refracts. So there's two refractions. That's really what I want to make sure yeah, I, get, I get clear to you guys, is that the refraction that I'm talking about is just as it is entering. We could also talk about the refraction as it exits the glass block. And so refraction is the bending of the light, but there's two going on here. The, the, the two together is not one refraction. There is two refractions. The total effect is two. So in other words, here's what I mean by angle number two. If I draw the normal here, and I'll extend it out, and I draw the new direction of the ray as it enters the glass block. That would be this right here. And so I'm ignoring the bending of the light right there. I'm talking about coming in right here, theta 1. And so this angle right there is theta 2. And hopefully you can see theta 2 is less than theta 1. There is a bending of the light closer to the normal. Now, that being said, on the way out, the light bends again. And maybe in a different color to kind of indicate this is a second refraction. If I draw a normal as it is hitting the glass air interface coming out, this right here then would now become theta 1. And then it would bend away from the normal. So this right here would be theta 2. And I would then would be ignoring this dotted line. That dotted line was just the extension of where the light was going in the glass block. In other words, there is two sets of theta 1 and theta 2. There's two, there's two refractions going on. And so as we get started here with refraction, I just wanted to make it extra crystal clear that I'm either looking at one surface or the other. And in this case, I'm just going to focus my attention as the light goes into the glass. So, what? Yeah. Right here? Between the normal and the ray. When it's coming out. That's the, the second theta 2. So, theta 1, the second theta 1 is as the light is measured from the normal right here in the blue. Yeah. Whereas the first set of theta 1 and theta 2 are right here. This is the normal in black. And so the normal in black it represents the going in and the normal in blue represents coming out. Fortunately, we'll see it's the same physics and therefore the same equation but there is a mathematical connection. And I wish it was as easy as the connection we just talked about, which is the law of reflection, and it's, it's not. But there is a, a bending going on here. Now, before we get to the equation of how much bending there is, 
we should probably ask more about why there is a bending. And let me ask you this, have you ever paddled a canoe, a kayak, and you know, a raft? Have you ever been in a marching band? Uh, I guess there's a lot of scenarios here. But what a turn is, is really one side going faster than another. So if I'm like in my kayak, and all I do is paddle on the right, <laughs> what ends up happening is I go to the left. Essentially, what I've done is I've kind of made the right-hand side go a little bit faster than the left-hand side. And you can kind of see that if you draw something that has kind of a width to it and so you give your your kayak the, the left side and the right side of your kayak so here's the kayak kind of heading in this direction and if I only paddle over here on the left it travels a further distance in the same amount of time and so the inside curve is a shorter distance and so that's what a curve is that's what a turn is a turn really occurs when one side goes faster than the other. That's why if you've ever been in a marching band, you know that if you guys are on the edge of it, uh, these people would slow down and take little steps in the marching band. And these people will now start taking bigger steps in order to keep them together. One has to go faster than the other. Uh, I guess it also works in reverse. I could be in my kayak and if I was already moving, I can take the right hand side and just drag my paddle and as I drag it I'm slowing down so as long as the left hand side goes faster than the right hand side there's a turn that takes place uh, airline pilots you know very common you'll be flying from and our place is perfect you'll you'll see the air traffic pattern it goes over here point conception and then turns and starts heading to north like san francisco and portland and seattle and so as it as the flight pattern turns the pilot will then give a little more power to this left hand side engine or maybe less power to the right side engine so that the plane then makes this right hand turn up the coast. And when they come down the coast, they're the different patterns. So they come down over the Sierras. So, so that, anyway, I hope I didn't confuse it with now making a right hand turn. But so if I make a right hand turn, I either slow down this side and speed up this side. That, that, that's what I'm getting at. In fact, I bought, brought out here kind of a little demonstration that kind of illustrates the effect in your car. Uh, we call it a differential in your car. You, you, you normally just think, oh, the car turns. But really what ends up happening when it turns is you make one side go faster than the other. Uh, these wheels illustrate it well in the sense that if I just roll it, both of these wheels have the same circumference and I kind of bolted them together so that they would turn together and so they have the same speed. And it can be a slow speed or a fast speed. It doesn't really matter what the speed is. As long as they're the same, it goes straight. But if I made one wheel a little thicker than the other, so in this case, I will put kind of a rubber band around the circumference of it. So when this wheel rotates one time around, it's going to travel a little bit faster. It's got a bigger circumference in that short amount of time. And if I put this wheel on my right hand side, when I give it a little nudge, it turns to the right because the I mean if you do left because the right hand side is going faster it's a bigger wheel or you could say the left hand side is going slower the point is it's a differential in speed it doesn't matter how fast I push the wheel watch I could I could push it fast and still turns or I could push it slow <laughs> and it still turns. 
because it's not a matter of how fast things are going it's a matter of the differential between the two and maybe it goes without saying but if I flipped it around now the left hand side is going to go faster and the right hand side is going to go slower and so it's always going to turn towards that slower side and so that's how something turns now why am I getting all of this and you know it almost sounds like we're talking about mechanics again but what I'm trying to illustrate here is light then is affected by the material now let's go back to the last chapter in the last chapter we said lost my black marker aha in the last chapter we said here that light is an electromagnetic wave and so if I were to draw this glass block and so you can kind of uh, imagine here's my glass block I'll kind of clean it up a little bit um, I don't want to touch this picture so maybe I'll just put it right here and I'll angle it a little different and so if you could imagine light coming straight at this glass block out here it doesn't really have anything in its way it doesn't have anything blocking it it doesn't have anything to interact with but when it gets to the glass itself I'll just make a little dot to represent some atoms and if you remember the atoms are these parts that have protons which are positive and electrons which are negative and each of those respond to electric and magnetic fields and that's what the wave is that is what the ray is it is an electromagnetic wave so there is this interaction it's it's sort of like if I were to say this if I were to walk across this room you know I might start over here at the door and kind of head and maybe I'm on a fast pace walking across the room and if there's nobody or nothing between that door and that door I just kind of head on through very quickly but if there is something that will interact with me uh, maybe I get right here and somebody asks me a question so I stop and answer the question and then I continue on you know and, and so there's a delay if you will there's a slowdown uh, and that's going to be the key to understanding the law of refraction because remember a bending or a turning is because one side goes faster or slower than the other and so your author starts this section and rightfully so let me get back to the beginning by pointing out this fact that light is an electromagnetic wave light will interact in fact let me just kind of pause at this equation right here he says then the speed of light in the material is reduced by some multiplication factor so remember C is the speed of the light in the vacuum and so this is what we were talking about last chapter uh, when we said that light is an electromagnetic wave and we had the permeability and permittivity of free space and we said one field makes another makes another makes another and so how quickly it propagates is based upon this it, permittivity of free space and permeability of free space okay but that could also be reduced so I need to be more clear that C represented the speed of light in a vacuum the speed of light just because of the fact of nature how does an electric field then affect a magnetic field which affects the electric field which affects the magnetic field and so that's the what I'll call the natural speed of of light how one affects another however that can be reduced by some other factor and that's what this n is and so this n is often referred to as an index and as you're going to see this number is connected to a speed reduction 
which is then connected to the bending of the light and hence the name index of refraction. And so your author lists some of these and so your first table and information for today I'll call this table one or I guess I should say your author calls it table number one and he says something to this effect and he starts with the, the gases uh, the gases, as you might imagine, probably have a minimal effect on the, the light. The gases have molecules spread out. And so you can see that this factor is for air is 1.000291. Or let me make it very clear. For a vacuum, N would be exactly 1, right? Now this is what you would get. So in a vacuum, if you put in a 1 here, this is the speed of light in a vacuum. So any number greater than 1 would be our materials. And in the case of air, it's barely above 1. In fact, all those gases that are listed there, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and oxygen, they're barely above 1. So does any of these gases have an effect on the light and slow it down? Yes. By much? No. But is it enough to get some bending, some refraction? Yes, but not nearly as much as things that are, say, solid. And so as we go down this list, we've got some liquids. Probably the most important one to point out is water, 1.333. So the speed of the light slows down by 33% when it gets into water which is a significant amount of slowdown, so therefore it's a significant amount of bend. Um, what I was showing you on the board probably fits in this category as a plexiglass, and so 1.5. And so you clearly saw the light bend as it entered, and also bend again as it was exiting. And so that is a number we would need to know when working with our our plexiglass. And most of our glasses are around that. Uh, some of our flint glass a little bit higher than that. Uh, I will point out diamond. Diamond's worth mentioning. It's a big number. Mm, that's one of a couple of reasons why diamonds sparkle so much. They really bend the light really well. Uh, and so they're cut right. They've got a high index. And they also got a high amount of dispersion. And you put those three factors together, you get this natural behavior of diamonds, which make them sparkle, make them reflect, make them have a colorful uh, rainbow, and uh, especially when they're clear uh, diamonds. Uh, anyways, just know that there's a long list here of how much, again, does the light slow down. That's going to be an important number here. Now, your author, I think, does a good job with this, this picture here. He's got this, this lawnmower, and he's trying to give you an example, and I would call it more of a mechanical example than an optical example, but it, but it works really, really well. Um, I like to kind of use this divider with the table, my students, and say, okay, well, I mean, well, watch what would happen if this was kind of the dividing line. And in this picture, the dividing line is between a sidewalk and the grass. But the idea here is that as the lawnmower is heading towards the grass, notice that this, if you were on the lawnmower, front right wheel hits the grass first. And because of that, it will slow down. And so the right hand side of the lawnmower is slowing down before the left hand side. And so that's a turn. And so while there's a transition going from the sidewalk to the grass, there is a turning that is going on. Now, once the whole lawnmower is on the grass, then both the left and the right have slowed down, but there's no differential. And that's why I took some time to mention it's the differential in the speed. And so if I take these rubber bands off, it doesn't matter if this goes slow. If both wheels are going slow, it still goes straight. And so if both wheels go fast, it goes straight. If both wheels go slow, 
it goes straight. So once the lawnmower completely gets on the grass, it now continues in a straight line. And I hope that's what you saw here in my glass block. Uh, maybe I'll power down the light so you can see it again. And uh, so I don't mess up that drawing. Maybe I'll just tilt it here. Uh, but again, drawing a normal, this would be theta 1. And then drawing the normal in the glass, this right here would be theta 2. <laughs> And so notice the ray right there in the glass travels straight. The only bending going on was while it was transitioning into the glass or transitioning out of the glass. And so those are our two uh, refractions. And so we will then have a conceptual, I think, way of saying that we can decide which way the light is going to bend by then knowing the speed differential. And so in our case, kind of like this lawnmower here, as the light is entering the right hand side touches the glass first and slows down. And so drawing a kind of a picture of this, I've got this ray and I'll draw the ray with a little bit of thickness to it. And then I hit this glass block and right here as the light's traveling, again, if you kind of imagine yourself in the light beam or on that lawnmower, you would say your right hand edge hit first. And so because of that, there's going to be this part where the distance traveled in the glass is short compared to the distance that is outside the glass. In other words, the right-hand side goes slower. And that's what I was trying to illustrate with the kayak and the marching band, is it will always turn to the side that goes slower. And so this would tell me that as I went from air into glass, there is going to be a turn towards the slower side. It would be towards the normal. So going in, it turned towards the normal. Now, I'll say it again, once you're in the glass, you're going to travel in a straight line because now all the light is in the glass and all of it is now going slow. And there's only bending when there's a differential in it. So then, when you come out of the glass, notice the right hand side comes out first. And now kind of the opposite effect. Since the right hand side comes out first and it goes into the air, that's where it goes faster now. And so now the right hand side is the fast side or put another way, the left hand side is the slow side. And so it's going to bend towards the left which would be what we would call away from the normal. And so that really explains our, our bending. And so you can imagine that there must be a mathematical connection between the angle when it comes in, theta 1, and the angle when it goes out, theta 2. And you probably would imagine that, that those two angles would depend of course, on the speed difference. So you would expect an N1 and an N2. So N1 being the index, which represents the speed when it's in material number one, going into material number two. And so sure enough, your author,
and I'm going to follow his, his suit because there's a lot to talk about here today, without proof goes through what is referred to as Snell's Law in honor of Snell and he's the one who kind of reasoned this out. He's the one who reasoned that light would bend really no different than a kayak or a canoe would bend when it changes its, its speed, when you make one side go faster than the other. And so after he goes through the work and the geometry, he comes up with this equation. And so let me put that on the board. So if you take N1 and then the sine of theta1, And so that's kind of telling you then, okay, what is the speed in number one? And then, of course, what angle do you have? Because then as it goes into number two, it's going to have a new speed. And so it's both N1 and N2 are, are in there. And then, of course, then that's going to be theta two. And so that's probably the best way to write the law of refraction. That there's a mathematical connection between theta 1 and theta 2. And like I said, sadly, it's a little harder mathematical connection. And I was playing my calculator this morning. And I, let me turn on my calculator app then. I think I left it back in the lab. Had it out here this morning, and then I go, oh, let me not take it to the lab. And then I did, and I go, oh, I know I'm going to forget it. Then I did. All right. But uh, I will then do some examples. Let's go to, uh, how about example number five here? And uh, jumping over to page uh, 1142. See, we did number two earlier. Let's try this one on refraction. Uh, the first one says just w what is the speed of light in water and what is it in glycerin? All right. So this one, I guess, doesn't have the law of refraction in it. It just is what's the, the speed. And so the speed would be C divided by N. So in the first case, it's going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by the index for, and that's why we'll need that table one. And the first one that they said is water. That one we saw, so I'll just put 1.33 on here. Uh, the other one, I don't know what it is, and I, did, I think I saw it there in the table. Let's look for uh, glycerin. Let's see, where was I? About 1,098, and now a little further than that. Ah, here we go. And it looks like they've got 1.473. All right, so 1.473. And so grabbing my calculator, 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 1.33 give me 2.26. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And it's going to be a little bit slower than that. 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 1.473. And so we're looking at about a 2 point, uh, I'll call it 0, 07 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So those are our measured values. When and why did it slow down? By, by how much? Now, the other one, the other example, number 10. Let me come back over here. Let's see what this was. A, about a 1124. Let's try problem number 10 here. 
And 10 will, I think, help us a lot with the mirrors and the lenses we're about to get to here, is because we're going to ask what happens to the light. And in addition to what happens to the light, we can ask ourselves, then what does the person perceive is happening as the light now has been redirected due to refraction or reflection? And so what they're saying here is we've got one person on the deck above the water and we've got one person under the water. Now, fortunately, the light works the same way forward and backwards. You can kind of see that in the equation, that there's going to be this bending of light. And if it started in one medium, let's say air, and goes into water, that's what would happen to the light that was reflecting off of this person. So this person is standing up on the deck. The light leaves the person and it has to go to this person for this person underwater to see it. And since it is going to change its speed into the water and slow down, if you kind of imagine you're moving along this beam, the right hand side of the beam would hit first and slow down so it would turn towards the right or turn towards the normal and then go to this person. So this is the path of the light that goes from the person on deck to the person underwater. And so we would call the air index one and the water index two. But mathematically, if you switch the roles and you let, think about the light going the other direction, and so you start in the water, so now one becomes the water, and goes into the air, that would be an example of the person on the deck trying to see the person underwater. Okay, so the person underwater, the light would look something like this. The light would come off of the person, and that's what this arrowhead is for. It would come out and then bend away from the normal towards the person. So the actual path of the light is the same, just in reverse. And again, like I said, you can see this in the math, that the light going from the person on the deck to the person in the water, so here would be air, and here would be water. Uh, but if you look at the light the other direction, okay, so it's starting in the water, so now N1 would be the water going into the air, it would bend away from the normal. But mathematically, if you interchange 1 and 2, you get the same thing. So not a surprise that the amount of bending towards the normal as the light goes into the water is the same as the amount of bending when the light comes out. But when you ask, what do they perceive, that becomes kind of interesting here. Because this person, standing on the deck, has been programmed to think of light coming in a straight line. We all are. And so we don't think of the light as bending. We think of the object as being at a different location. And so the person on the deck says, oh, there's the person underwater, and they just kind of do a straight line shot from where the light is coming to their eyes. And so they would think this underwater person is higher up in the water. Uh, maybe you've even looked from a deck down in a pool. Uh, I know this happens to me a, a lot. I mean, I'm used to it, so I guess I don't think too much about it anymore. But if you stand on the deck and you look down, you see that black line and you get ready to, you know, practice some laps. When you look there, the, the black line just looks so big. It looks so close. And you go, oh, that's, that's not very deep. I'm just going to jump in and get ready. And so you kind of jump on in and before you realize it, you go, Psh! And you go much deeper than you thought. You know, you know, pop up. And if it's a new pool I haven't been to, I always kind of pop up and I look. Because there's always a sign. And, and it, oh, it's five feet here. It only looked like three. I thought I was just going to jump in and touch the bottom. And I went pretty deep before I got to the, to the bottom. And, and then this is why. 
because I'm from the deck looking in and everything at the bottom looked closer up. The reverse is also true. The, the person under the water is going to get a misperception. Uh, they're going to think the light came to them in a straight line. And so a straight line puts the person on the deck further away and kind of up and elevated. And so they're going to look underwater and I don't do this too often. I don't know if many people do, but you know, a bit under the water and practicing the scuba and you'll look up and you'll see the people on the deck and they, it looks kind of like this, uh, what you'd call a fish lens view of it. You know, it just kind of everything just kind of looks kind of angled, trapped in and, and, and further away. And so that's what the scuba diver would, would get out of it. Well, let me read the, the question here. It says, a scuba diver training in a pool looks at the instructor as shown in the diagram. What angle does the ray from the instructor's face make with the perpendicular to the water at the point where it enters? The angle between the ray and the water and the angle between the ray in the water and the perpendicular to the water is 25 degrees. Now, he doesn't show it here in the diagram, but let me just double read that here. It says the angle between the ray, so right here, in the water and the perpendicular, that's the normal, to the water is 25. So, they're calling this angle here the 25. And so let me come over here and maybe draw my picture and then I can do the math. So I'll leave Snell's Law up here. And I'll give us an option here. Because the ray comes in if it's starting from the deck, it comes in, and then I would call this theta 1. I would then call the air index 1, and then it would bend towards the normal. So I would call that theta 2, and I would call this index theta 2. And if I read that description right, they're calling this angle the 25 the angle between the ray and the normal, okay? But in the water, the angle between the ray in the water and the perpendicular. Now, I must say, we could also do this problem just as easily by thinking of the light that comes from the scuba diver and then bends towards the instructor. And in that case, I guess this would now be called theta one. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is what we call one and two. One is where the light starts from. Two is what it goes into. And so depending on your view, what somebody calls number one, somebody else would call number two. It depends on which ray we're, we're looking at here. And fortunately, as I was pointing out, they do the same thing in reverse. So I would say we can do this either way. We can think about the ray that starts in the water and therefore theta one is in the water and theta one is 25 degrees. And then it bends and that becomes theta two and the air becomes N two. And so it doesn't matter. If you, if you look at it this case and you apply here, you're going to say the index is 1.0003 for the air and the unknown is theta 1. And then it goes into the water, which is 1.33 and the sine of 25 degrees. And so that's how I would do the math for this picture with the light coming from the instructor to the scuba diver. But if I was doing it for this and 
situation from the scuba diver to the instructor, I guess I would say it starts in the water, 1.33, and the angle one is the 25 degrees. Then it goes into the air, 1.0003, and theta two is what we're hunting for and is the unknown. But I'm, again, hopefully making it very clear, the interchanging of one and two gives you the same result here. So I'm going to just then do the math over here. Why not? And say, okay, what is theta two? All right, so let me just check to see if I am in degrees. Ah, okay, good. I am. And so I will put 1.33 times the sine of 25. Uh, then I will divide it by 1.0003. And now I will take the inverse sign of the last answer. And I get 34.2 degrees. And so that's the math I wanted to illustrate. How, where does the, the light go? How does it come from? And in a few moments here we'll get into lenses and this will be how we control the light. This is how we will shape the lens in order to determine where the light goes and what will the lens do? Will it make it bigger? Will it make it smaller? Will it make it look closer? Will it make it look further? And that's the whole idea of these two basic pieces of geometric optics. We can control the light, and by controlling the light, either by reflection or refraction, we can then make things look, like I said, bigger, closer, further, smaller. Give it all kinds of illusions by how we control the light. Now, there's a couple other fun things before we get deeper into the lenses and the mirrors. Uh, the next little section here is called total internal reflection. Because something interesting, and I think even a little bit surprising, can happen in a special case, and I say a special case because it only happens when you go from a slow medium to a high medium. And I mean by speed, not size. So if you are traveling in the water, the light is in the water, and then it goes into the air, something interesting can happen when the angle gets big. And so this section, let's see, what are we on, section four? Yeah, is called total internal reflection. And as the name implies, oh, knock this down. You just get one beam. Let me darken it a little bit in here. Let me grab my triangle here. We put it here on the board. And I hope you can see as the light enters, there's a little piece that reflects and a little bending that goes on. And so as it goes in, there is both a reflection and a refraction. Now, I don't want to focus on the light going into the prism. I want to focus on the light coming out of the prism. Because remember, I said this interesting thing can only happen when you go from a slow speed to a high speed. So you have to go from glass into air. You know, this would never occur going into the glass. It's only coming out of the glass. And so I'm going to change my angle of my prism, maybe like there for a second. 
because if I focus my attention on the light coming out can you see that as it tries to come out some of it is reflected and some of it is refracted so we talk about these two laws but we got to remember they're both going on at the same time some of the energy is being reflected and some of it is being refracted uh, here's where your author does a good job with uh, his, his pictures here um, let's see where were we we're about a th about 1100 He shows, ah, right here, and again, let me emphasize, notice he's showing the light coming out of the glass, and so as the light is coming out, part of the energy is reflected and part of it is refracted, so there is a reflected and a refracted ray. That's what I'm trying to show you on the board here. Some of the energy is reflected, some of it is refracted. And if you look at the refracted one, you'll see the intensity and the angle change as I change the angle of incidence. Well, that makes sense because obviously the refracted angle is connected to the incident angle. I mean, that's what Snell's law was, was just telling us. But I don't know if you can, how well you can see this, but if I put it in this location, you might see that the amount of reflected light is very small. The amount of refracted light is very big. And as I change the angle, more and more energy is reflected less and less is refracted and your author is trying to point out that as this angle increases so remember the angle is measured from the normal so as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger this angle of course is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and when this refracted angle actually gets to 90 degrees you might say at 90 degrees you're not really coming out what ends up happening at that point as all of the energy is reflected and zero is refracted so to say you have light going along at 90 degrees is a little misleading uh, you could say mathematically we have a beam at 90 degrees, but the intensity is zero. <laughs> and so it goes down, 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 down. And so at that point, that's called the critical angle. And so you can see here your author has put a little sub C here to say at this special place, at this critical angle, and in the picture below, he's trying to emphasize at angles even greater than the critical angle. So it's not just the critical angle. It first occurs at the critical angle. So at critical or anything greater than that, all the energy is reflected. Maybe now the ma name makes more sense. The name of this is called total internal reflection. In other words, all of it. The total amount is reflected. And you can see it right here. Let me keep changing the angle. And if you focus your attention on this beam right here, the refracted beam, you'll see it go down, down, down in intensity. Not just down in angle, it's doing that too, but down in intensity. And so the angle is getting bigger and the intensity is getting smaller because right about here, I'm not there quite yet, getting closer, oh, almost there. Right there, the intensity is really small. Most of the light is being reflected. And if I go just a hair more, there's nothing to see in terms of refracted. It's all gone. All of it reflected. And so that's called total internal reflection.
In fact, you can actually very simply solve for what that critical angle would be. Because what we're really saying here is when it comes out, this refracted angle is 90 degrees. Now, like I said in the picture, we can call it 90 degrees, but it's really 90 degrees with zero energy. <laughs> okay, it's gone down, down, down. And so let me, let me do that. In other words, here's what I would say. I would say if it started in material that has an index of 1 and we are at or coming out of the glass at the critical angle. And so I'm kind of solving the math for this scenario right here. The light is starting in the glass and so there's N1 and it is actually going to be hitting at the critical angle and what, of course what's meant by the critical angle is that the refracted beam would be at 90 degrees and so on the other side of the equation I would call that N2 and I would call that sine of 90 degrees and so this would give us a nice little mathematical formula for saying okay how do you find the critical angle. You know, what is the value of the critical angle? And fortunately, since the sine of 90 is just 1, we can just say that the sine of this magical angle, this special critical angle, is N2 over N1. And so I don't know if I'd call that a new formula, very useful, but it's a special application of Snell's law. It is saying what would happen at this particular situation. Now, why is this useful? Well, maybe you're a little familiar with fiber optics, but this is pretty much the world of modern technology. When we get on the internet, all this data is sent along these little pulses of light to these little tiny fibers of glass. And what's really nice, and your author's trying to show here, is if you have a piece of glass, uh, and it's kind of hard, I think, f to imagine glass being so thin like a hair, it's actually flexible. And so our fiber optics are right here. I mean, these have a piece of glass in them, then they put some plastic around them so that we, they don't get scratched. And so it, they're not as thick as they might look here, but they're a little thicker than a human hair, but they're flexible and they become pipes. So we call them light pipes, they're fiber optics. Uh, what we mean by that is if you were to shine a light in here, it would hit the edge of the glass at an angle greater than the critical angle. And because of that, it wouldn't come out of the glass. It would stay inside. It would be 100% reflected. And so, you can go to here, 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 go to here. And so you can direct the light. This is off an old computer system we would have. And this went onto the computer, and this went to the router. And so the little pulses of light can just snake through. Our fiber optics then run through the city and go to UCSB. And so every time we're on campus and you hit some uh, internet or some information, these little pulses of light go along this fiber. They buried under the ground. They go along the railroad tracks. They end up at UCSB eventually. And then they end up around the world from there. And they go up the AT&T line up to Morro Bay and under the ocean to Hawaii and under the ocean to... I think it's Tokyo and, and then the rest of Asia. And so we can get these little pulses of light. Uh, to kind of help students understand this better, uh, I grabbed some plastic to kind of represent our fiber optics. Uh, and so if I take my little laser beam here, uh, let's see, probably the easiest one to see is green. Where's my green one here? And if I shine it in one end, <laughs> it'll kind of get trapped in there. Now this is a straight line so it doesn't look very good and it's not very clean plastic so there's imperfections and the fact that you can see it is a bad sign. The fact that it actually hit something and came out means it came out. <laughs> the fact that you can see it. So 
Most of it, though, does go to the end of it. And so I took one of these plastic ones and just kind of heated it up and bent it. And that way you can kind of see this behavior that it does kind of come out this, this end here. It kind of arcs around. And what's kind of nice about this little cheapy thing is it, because it's cheap, all the imperfections in the plastic scatter the light, and you can kind of see that it's crawling around. Because when I do this with a real fiber optics, it's, it's, it's kind of boring. You couldn't see anything. <laughs> it, it stays in the, the, the light pipe. If I, if I shine it on this end, it goes through these glass tubes. And so if I were just to do this, shine it up here on these, you know, probably have to move it around because they're real small just to make sure I hit something. But the light would be going down here and you wouldn't see anything. Now, fortunately, they would come out this end. And so if I put the end facing you guys, maybe I can get some kind of light to come out there. Can you see any flashes of light on the end of it? I kind of move it around. Yeah. And so I think there's like 15 wires here. Should I turn those off? Oh, that's probably the reflection off of this here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, because this is kind of a shiny brass surface here, so it's doing probably that. But so they're just little, little tiny glass openings there. I'll do it this way so you can't see the reflection. How's that? <laughs> but as I, I move it around, little flashes of light. Might be easier the other direction. Maybe I'll do that. And this is kind of narrow. Hopefully I can still hit them. Whichever one I hit, do you see a little flash there on that end? Yeah. And so they kind of run, run through there. So that's this, this whole idea, a good, a good application of total internal reflection. And how we use it in today's technology is with our, our fiber optics. Well, this might be a good time for another example here. So let me try number 22. And like I said, it's really a special case of Snell's Law, but an important special case because it, you know, gives us our technology. Now, that's not the only place your author does a good job of showing. Uh, I think he's got some optical prisms here. Um, well, here he talks about the fiber optics. Here he shows a nice picture of the fiber optics. But I think he's got a pair of binoculars. It's kind of common in binoculars, yeah. And so, as we will soon be talking about in the next chapter, uh, how much we magnify something in a telescope or binoculars is based upon how long the tube is. And so you want this to be as long as you, you can, sadly, though, a pair of binoculars that sticks out two feet is a little obnoxious. I mean, how do you hold these binoculars? So instead, you make the light go down and back and forth in there. And so your actually distance that you hold is not as long as the actual path that the light takes. And so the light comes in and then it hits a glass prism so it goes in and then total internal reflection, total internal reflection, total internal reflection, total internal reflection and then to the viewer's eyes. Giving it the optical distance much longer than the actual physical distance so we can get the magnification effect. All right, uh, 1142. Get us kind of close. That's where we were last time. And uh, what I say, number 22. So 22 says, uh, an optical fiber uses flint glass cladded with crown glass. What is the critical angle? Okay, so remember this only occurs when you go from a low speed to a high speed. 
And so what they're saying here is you might have this fiber optic, so light comes in, and the inner part is the flint glass. Now we need to go back to that table, but the flint glass was the one I pointed out that has a higher index. It's like 1.6 something, 1.66 six or 1.67. So that's the place where the light is the slowest. And then as the light beam tries to escape, it will hit some crown glass. Number two. And again, you're only going to get total internal reflection is if N2 is lower than N1. See, because we got to go into a higher speed. All right, so the crown glass, we need to look that up too, but that's probably about a 1.51, somewhere in that category. And I guess I erased the formula I worked out, but it was the sign of the critical angle was N2 over N1. So let's go back to our uh, table here on about page 1100 and look up our two glasses. So our crown glass was 1.52 and our flint glass 1.66. All right, so I'm going to put over here 1.52 and 1.66. And this might be a good point to mention like I've done in these last couple of chapters. We're really doing some really advanced things. And because we're doing some advanced things, uh, your author oftentimes says, hey, the math level is a little beyond the scope of this class. And they give us these little formulas. And that's what we did with Snell's Law. That's what we did with the magnetic field from a solenoid. Uh, so I think the trickiest part for you guys is really knowing what formula to use. Not actually what is the formula, but what to use. At least that's my guess. That's what I'm thinking. It's like, okay, what do I use it and why? What does it mean? Because you can see now, it's just a couple of taps on my calculator to figure out what the critical angle is. But I needed to know that they were even talking about the critical angle. I needed to know what the formula was for the critical angle. I needed to know that the inner piece had to be a higher index. I needed to know that N1 would have been where the light started. And so that's where the, the hard part is. Is really not so much doing the math, but reading the equation and saying, okay, what is the meaning of this? Uh, because doing the math is fairly straightforward. I'll just go 1.52 divided by 1.66. Hit enter. Uh, then I'm going to go inverse sine of my last answer. And I get a critical angle of 66 degrees. 66.3. And so as long as this light down here is greater than 66.3, it'll just keep ricocheting around. And so if it bends, we just want to make sure that who's ever laying the fiber optic doesn't bend it too much because they bend it too much. We may actually hit less than the 66 degrees and the light comes out of the fiber. So we don't want to lay down our fiber with too much of a bending in it, but then the light just keeps ricocheting down the, the fiber. Yeah. It could, it could be greater than 66. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, again, I want to emphasize here that we call this a critical angle, and for some reason, I think because of the name critical, it comes across to students as if it's only at this angle. But... What your author is trying to say, and I'll try to repeat here, as you increase this angle, the refracted angle gets bigger, 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 and the intensity gets less, less, and less. And so at the critical angle is the first time 
you get a hundred percent reflection but this picture is trying to show that even for angles greater than you still get reflection okay so it's not just a reflection at one angle it's reflection at the critical and beyond also and you said it, it's when it goes from like n1 being slower and then n2 being the faster medium yeah okay yeah because again, it has to bend away from the normal. You, you might kind of illustrate it this way. If you imagine, again, yourself in a canoe, and you get to this point, if there's a differential on this side, and you paddle so much, on the left hand side you actually then make a turn and go back like a reflection and so that's kind of what's happening with this refraction is this uh, side comes out and it turns and then you might say it's half in and half out but the part that's in is going slow so then it turns some more and goes back where it came from oh, yeah because that left side it's the end two faster there right then it turns to the right right Whereas the other direction, if this was the slow side, it would just turn more and get out even more so. So it never goes back in. And so this, like I said, is a, a special case and an important special case, but still a special case. You have to go from a slow medium to a high medium in order to get this reflection. All right, so now if I continue on to section 25.5, your author points out a little more detail about this index of refraction. I'll call it dispersion. Uh, hopefully it will make sense. Let me draw a picture back here that I had earlier. I said if you were sending a beam of light... at this glass block this glass block has a bunch of atoms in it and this was where I gave my analogy of I'm walking across the room here and if I walk at a fast pace and there's nothing in here to interact with me I go pretty fast but if there is somebody in the room and I interact with that person it's going to slow me down so we call this N and said there is some kind of factor. We call it the index of refraction. It gets even more interesting because I'm going to say N depends on the frequency. Or you could say the wavelength. Or you could say the color. And so in other words, if I was representing red light coming through here, I would interact differently than if I was coming through as green light. And having a different frequency means I'm going to interact differently with the atoms. And so a little more accurate is to say there's not just one index, there's an index at each color. And that's what this next section is. That's called dispersion. That's really saying that each color would bend a slightly um, different amount. Each color would have a different speed. And your author does a good job here of showing a table somewhere. Ah, right here. And he looks at the different indices. Uh, let's look at water, for example. Water, what we've been doing is saying the index is 1.33. But I would say that's kind of on average. Because if you look across the visible spectrum, starting with water and starting with red, you would say it's 1.33. Then it goes up a little bit for orange, up a little bit for yellow, up a little bit for green, up a little bit for blue, and up a little bit for violet. 
And so you'll notice a trend on all of these, they go up, but the point being, and especially diamond changes the most, it goes from 2.4, so it's got a high index, to 2.45, and there is a slight change. So that table before was kind of the average, 1.33 for water. You'll see the red was lower than that, but the violet was more than that. And so we can give a number that kind of just gives oh, all the visible light is about equivalent to about a 1.33. But the truth is they would bend by different amounts. Different colors would then slow down at different rates. And you can see since the index in the violet is always higher, well I shouldn't say always, most of the time, 99% of the time. Uh, and I think everyone he's got listed here is higher. Yeah. So for most materials it goes up as you go to the higher frequencies. All right. And so he's trying to say then if you wanted to be a little more accurate here and figure out how much the light bends and so here's our little prism. Here's the light coming in, here's it bends and here's it bending again. If you don't know what color it is, you might just take the average effect, you know, and say, okay, let's just say this is that uh, flint glass prism. Since I happen to have a flint glass prism here in a second, I'll show you. But 1.66, we can calculate that 1.66. How much does the light actually bend? But if you get down to details, you will see that the violet is actually going to bend the most. Violet is actually traveling the slowest. And so this is a better picture of what might happen with white light. Now maybe I should point out white light is your brain telling you all the colors are coming. And black is your brain telling you no light is coming. So you know, you close your eyes, put a pillow over your face, you, you can go, what do, what, do, what do you see now? You see black. So when you see black, that means no light is coming to you. When you see white, that's your brain saying, all right, I've got yellow light and I've got green light and I've got the whole rainbow of colors coming to me. So if we start with white light and we send it to the prism, they're all going to bend roughly the same amount, but violet will bend just a hair more. That's dispersion. That is saying that the index or the slowing down of violet light is a little bit more than the slowing down of the red light. And so that's why you'll see violet here, red over here, and green and yellow in the middle. Yeah. Does that mean that in the glass prism that the violet is traveling fastest? Slowest. It's got the highest index. So remember the speed is divided by n. So the speed is C divided by N. So the one with the highest index, which is violet, would go the slowest. That also means it has a greater differential in speed, and that's where the bending comes from. The bending comes from the differential in speed. So violet is going to bend the most because violet slowed down the most. Or I should also say speeds up the most when it comes out. So there's bending both going in and bending coming out. In this, in this case, we have, a, you know, we have a bending or a refraction twice. We have once coming in, and so you can see he kind of separates the two lines. And he's got bending again coming out. And in both cases, the violet bends the most. So the end results of entering and exit is that the violet will deviate the most from its original directions, all right? Its original direction was this way. And violet deviated the most. Red deviated a lot also. Remember, there's not much difference between the violet and the red, but there is some. So they all deviate quite a bit, but violet just a little bit more than the red. And, of course, this is another reason why, and where, where that little diamond go, your author says, this is our explanation of the three pieces of why we like the look of a diamond. 
uh, the light comes in and if you cut it right and so a good cut diamond will get a lot of total internal reflections going on and so as you hold the diamond, the light, and you wiggle it around, the light comes right back to you. Gets trapped down, bounces around, comes out. And so it's got that, that sparkle effect. And because the index is so high, it happens that some, the critical angle is kind of small, and you get a lot of light coming back. So between the cut of the diamond and the high index of the diamond, and then finally the dispersion of the diamond, what will come back is that the colors will actually separate and so as you hold the diamond and wiggle it around you get this reflection of light sometimes it's green and purple and well I should say violet uh, uh, red and so forth anyways but all of our materials do that of course you're probably most familiar with the colors separating from water droplets we we call that a rainbow and so just like a prism a, a rainbow would would work. Um, I think he shows a nice picture yeah, of a rainbow here. And he says, okay, so here's the white light coming in. Uh, there's some refraction going on and the violet's going to bend a little bit more than the red. And so they already separate out. Then they go under total internal reflection on the back side of the water droplet and then come down and then bend again coming out. But again, notice the violet bends the most. So if I was standing over here, this is how I would see the rainbow. I would be standing here, the sunlight would be coming from behind me, and the raindrops would be in front of me. And so with the sun behind me and the rain in front of me, it comes in and comes right back to me. So I need the sunlight, I need the rain, I need to be standing in the right location. And uh, I would say, if I'm standing right here, I would see violet light. Sadly, I wouldn't see the red light. The red light would be landing in front of me. However, usually in a rainstorm, there's another droplet above it. <laughs> and the red one from that would go to my eyes. So I get the violet light from this raindrop that's a little low. And I get the red light from the raindrop that's above. And I get the, the whole spectrum. I get the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, the indigo, and the violet. And it's three-dimensional, so I see it here and here and here and here and here. And so I see this arc with the violet on the inside of the, of the bow, which is why I think he throws a nice little picture here to kind of say, okay, this is what this observer down here would see. And they would see a bow and they would see the violet on the inside of the bow and they'd see the red on the outside of the bow. And so there's our dispersion effect. All right, well, oh, we're past our break time, but let me just take a, uh, uh, an example here and then we'll, we'll take our break and then get into the final steps of this chapter. But number 29 is what I wrote next on my list here by saying, all right, what's going on here? So, number 29 look like a good example to do. Remember what it was? Uh, let's go to 1142, uh, 29 down here somewhere. And 29 says, a beam of white light goes from air into water at an incident an angle of 75 degrees. What is the angle of the red light compared to the angle of the violet light? Okay, so coming over here, I would say here comes the white light and the angle is pretty big. It's 75 degrees, starting in the air, so the index is 1.0003. It's at an angle of 75 degrees. And maybe using my blue for the violet, the violet would have an index that is slightly higher 
than the red. So both red and violet are going to bend towards the normal. There's no doubt about that. It's just the violet's going to bend more. And I'll go ahead and put green in my picture, but I won't bother to calculate it. But remember, this is just Snell's Law. So this just says N1 times sine theta 1 is equal to N2 times sine theta 2. And that's what we're looking for, sine theta 2, or just theta 2. So let me write it this way. We would start in the air, 1.0003. And I would do sine of 75 degrees. I'm going to go ahead and leave N2 alone here for a second. To save a little time in my calculation, I can then get theta 2 for blue by looking up the index for blue. But I could also get theta 2 for red by looking up the index for red. All right, so I'll grab my calculator here and head back to our little chart. Let me just check this question out again. What does it say? It says for red and for blue. And they give us some numbers to, to work with. All right, and so that little chart, which showed the different indices, was further than I thought. So where is it? Ah, right, right here. And so maybe I'll do the red first, 1.331. So coming over to here, I'm going to go 1.0003 multiplied by the sine of 75 degrees. Uh, then I'm going to divide it by 1.331. Uh, let me just double check. Is that what I said for red? Okay. And then I will go the inverse sine of that. And so for red, the angle would be 46.5 degrees. But for blue, okay, 1.0003 times sine of 75. Let me put this back in my calculator and divide by the index now for blue. Okay, so blue, no violet is 1.342. And so we are looking at 46.1 degrees. 46.1 degrees. So numerically, notice how the blue is a smaller number. That means it bent more. Right? Because it started at 75. And so it's bending towards the normal. And so it's going 75 and it's going down. So this one bent more than that one. Not, not by much, like I said. If you just wanted, if you didn't know what color to use, you would just use 1.33 for water and just say, okay, they all bend roughly the same. But there is a slight difference between them. And so I'll, I'll finish up and we'll go on our break here and then get a chance to, to show you this. And so I have, if I can get it a little dark in here, a nice little prism and if I can get some sunlight in here by maybe propping the door open grabbing a little mirror here oh well I'll still like to show you, but the uh, marine layer hasn't burned off yet. I figured it would have by now. It would have time. Well, it's only 9.30. Okay, well, anyways, we don't have any sunlight, so I guess I won't be showing you right away here, but uh, maybe after the break. All right, let's take our break, and I'll 
last uh, 15 minutes, so let's come back at 5 tell and finish up the chapter. All right, see you then. <laughs> well, hey, welcome back from the break. I thought uh, we better continue on. We still have two more sections. It's kind of a, a big section, but your author kind of makes it I, I hopefully straightforward, and so hopefully I will too, and then we'll wrap up this chapter and move on to our other chapters in, in optics. But I, I thought I would show you one thing that's kind of fun to see. I mean, obviously there's some marbles in here, and... All of you guys can, I think, see the marbles. And the marbles then are different colors. And of course, what's happening here is the light comes down. And so we've got this room that is white light. And as I was alluding to earlier, white light means this is your brain telling you all the colors are there. And so one of these, I'll pick on a red one here, is we would call it red because what happens here is all the light comes in and everything but red gets absorbed. In other words, red reflects off and goes to your eyes. And so the blue gets absorbed, the yellow gets absorbed, but the red gets reflected. And so the end result is this looks red. Uh, same logic with the green one. Uh, everything but the green gets absorbed, the green gets reflected. That's why maybe a kind of a fun experiment to do as a life science person is to take a plant and put it under a green light. Many people respond, well, plants are green, green light, this is great, plant's going to grow. No, plant will die. Because why is a plant green? Because it reflects green. It doesn't want green. It absorbs everything else. It doesn't want the green. And so the last thing it wants is green. So you put it under a green light where it only has green light, it, it doesn't, it's not part of the photosynthesis process. You, if you guys have studied the photosynthesis process, you know there's a band of absorptions in the red and a band in the blue, but not in the green. And so it doesn't want the green. All right, but things that are kind of what we would call solid here, they're pretty easy to see. But I would ask this question. What about these marbles? They're clear. Now, I, I think you can see them, but yet they have all the light even going through them. How do you see them? And this is this idea of refraction. You see, the light bends, changes its angle, and you can see kind of, I'll call it a disturbance in the angle of the light. And so you know something's there, even though the light went through it, it, it just deviated. And so clearly, you know, something's here. Well, what's fun about these marbles is they have the same index of refraction of water. So in other words, when they're in the air, there's a difference between the air and the marbles. And so they refract the light and you can clearly see a disturbance. But what if you put the marbles in water? What do you see? doesn't refract the light. Uh, there is no disturbance, if you will. And so it looks like there's nothing in here because the light is just getting bent as you would have thought from a regular beaker of water. There's not an additional effect due to the marbles. And so the marbles are kind of, kind of, well, it's kind of fun to watch. They just kind of disappear optically. They're gone. If you pour the water out, well, they somehow magically reappear. And it's just not how they affected the light. All right, well, we better uh, wrap up this uh, chapter. We got a lot to talk about in, in optics, and I have a, a feeling that I'm going to have to subtract off some material and I was telling the in-person people so I'll tell you online people that you know we'll do as much optics as we can today and tomorrow and then call it good on optics and so when we start next week we'll just pick up on on modern physics and so we might lose out on a couple of sections on optics it's both good and bad I think the bad part is it's gonna you know, you're going to miss out maybe on telescopes, but we'll do microscopes in set instead. And uh, so I'll just have to make a judgment call. So sadly, you'll lose out on that. But uh, at the same time, it would be just too much to cover. You guys are probably already overwhelmed with all the homework problems and test problems and everything going on in the uh, fast-paced summer school uh, as it is.
So the last part of this, the last two sections deal with lenses and mirrors. And so we've covered the, I would call the, the basic uh, physics uh, principles here. And so your author starts off here and says, okay, let's look at section six. And I will say section seven is nearly identical to it. But he says, let's look then at what a lens can do. Uh, he says, let's look at images that are formed by lenses. And of course, by lens, we mean that we're going to refract the light. And your author starts here. He says, what if you took a lens or a piece of glass that was shaped kind of on both sides like this? Uh, I've got a pretty big lens here. I don't know if you guys can see it on camera or in person here, but big round one. It kind of bows out this way and bows out this way. And so we're going to borrow a word from math when something bows out this way or like this mirrored surface bows out. This, this is called convex. Uh, when it curves inward, that's concave. Right? And so, you know, the cave where the bear sleeps. Right? It's inside. Vex. This is the point out, you know sticking out. Anyway, so I've got vex on both sides. I've got a convex lens. And your author says some interesting physics about it is that if you look at a light beam coming in, it's going to bend towards the normal because it's going from air into glass. And so he calls this theta 1 and then this is a small angle theta 2. And of course, coming out, it bends away from the normal, but because of the shape, this side of the glass curved the opposite of this side. You have theta coming in now a bigger number than here, and then it bends away, so that makes the light bend down. What I'm trying to say is, as the light goes in, as the light comes out, it each bends down. I mean, the first time it bends towards the normal, but you can see the normal's angled down, so the light bends towards the normal. But coming out, it bends away from the normal, but the normal's angled up, so it bends down. And so beam number one bends down, bends down, and then crosses the center line. It's exactly the reverse for beam number three here. Beam number three would bend up and bend up and then cross. Beam number two just kind of hits a flat surface, both going in and going out. So there's no bending. And so your author is trying to say that a shape like this would bend the light so that the light converges. And so we're going to call this a focal point. It's a certain distance from the lens. So we'll call this the focal length of the lens. It's probably best illustrated with this contraption here. Here I have a piece of plexiglass that's curved just like this in a convex way. Let me come over here and make it a little dark in here. Oh good, give me a chance to check the sunlight. It's not quite as bright as I would like it, so I'll wait a little while, but I do want to show you that dispersion. Um, but let me go ahead and I'll move my triangle, I'll even move this so that I have five beams of light. I'll power down here and I will put this convex piece right there and kind of illustrate my, my point. That there is a magical place, which your author says, point F has a Actually, I think he called it capital F for the point. It's the distance we're going to need for our math. And so we're going to say it's a certain distance away from the center of the lens. So keep that in mind here that there is this magical point. Now, here's something fun to keep in mind. We often label a focal point just on one side of the lens. But if I turn the lens around, it does the same thing. 
And so it doesn't matter if the light goes right to left or left to right. Uh, this is just like that scuba diver and instructor problems we have. The light travels the same path in reverse. And so if the light had started at this focal point and spreading out, it would then go, go parallel. I'm going to take advantage of saying that there is a focal point on both sides. And depending on how I draw my rays, I will use one focal point or the other focal point. Uh, your author does this in his picture. He kind of shows a magnifying glass focusing things and burning it. But he says something like this. If you were to put a light bulb where the light spreads out right here at the focal point. And again, there's one on each side. Okay, But the light would travel in reverse and then go, go parallel. Oh, that would make a good flashlight. You, you put a bulb and you put a lens good headlight. You put a bulb, you put a lens. and You make the light go parallel as it comes on out. Now, here's why that can be very useful. If I turn back on the lights here, or if I go to some of his pictures, he says, okay, knowing the behavior now of the light, what would happen if you put somebody in front of the lens, then the light went through the lens. In other words, the light gets redirected. As it gets redirected, where would that person, that object appear to came, come from? If you remember yesterday, we did the same thing. We did it with a mirror, though. We did it with a flat mirror. We said, where would the light appear to be coming from? Let's play the same game, a harder game, but same game where we say, okay, let's take this person. All right. And so in my case, I'm going to come over here and maybe give myself a little bit of working room here and say, okay, here is the lens. Uh, maybe I'll put a focal point here and I'll even put one on both sides. Okay. And say, let me take back here a person. And again, like I did before, I'm just going to call this the height of the object and the distance away, the distance of the object. And if the light goes then through the lens, I would ask, what is this person over here going to see? And probably the easiest ray to draw is remembering that the light comes off in every direction from the top of this object. Uh, I'll draw my first one maybe in a different color. I'll pick red here. But the ray that comes parallel here would go through the focal point. Wasn't that the whole point of the focal point? Was to say if you have a, some light that's parallel, when it hits the lens, it goes through this magical point called the focal point. So that's what one ray is. Let's say that's the ray that goes to your left eye. Okay, now what about the other ray that's going to go to your right eye? So you could use your depth perception to figure out where it is. All right. So I'll draw a difference color. How about green? And say, all right, uh, what other ray should I draw? Now, personally, I like the reverse because I keep emphasizing that what the light does is in reverse. And so the reverse one, and maybe I should scroll, is listed just above this, this picture. So I'll come all the way back to here and say, I've drawn ray number one. I like to draw then ray number three because it's the reverse. It says what the other ray would do is the one that leaves the top of the arrowhead would go through the focal point, hits the lens, and now go parallel. And when I say parallel, I should say, you know, parallel to the center line here. Now, you only have to draw two rays to kind of understand what's going on because now you can say, all right, so this red one goes into my left eye, the green one goes into my right eye, 
not knowing the light has been diverted, I would trace these back and say it's coming from right here. So this is where the arrowhead is. And so the top of the arrowhead would be right here. And if we did the same thinking with the middle of the arrowhead like we did for the mirror, we would get the middle of the arrowhead right here. And if we did the same thing with the bottom of the arrowhead, we would get right here. And so, what somebody standing over here would appear to see is an upside down image. Now, I'll draw the third ray also, just for completeness, but I always keep in mind, you only need two. And your author says number two is pretty easy to draw, because if you go through the center of the lens, you would be going just above and just below, so the bending would cancel off, and you'd go in a straight line. And so it's kind of easy to draw the straight line ones. So maybe in black, I'll draw the one through the, the middle. But as you can see, all three of these rays appear to deviate from right here. So you only need two of those three to figure out where the image is supposed to be here. And then if we label it like we did for the mirror, if we call this the height of the image, and we call this then the distance of the image. You would think that through a bunch of geometry there should be a mathematical connection between the position of the object, the position of the image, and the focal length, right? The focal length is what's controlling it. And there is. There clearly is a mathematical connection. And here in order to save a little time, let me not derive it for you. I don't even think the author does. The author just says there is a nice mathematical connection between these two. And he labels them. There. Does he... Yeah, see, then he just gives it to you. So I'm going to play his same game and say, look, we, just to get to some results, let's just say that there is a mathematical connection between the position of the object, the position of the image, and the focal length. Uh, there is also a mathematical connection between the height of the image and the height of the object. Let's call this the magnification. And I think he uses a lowercase m, yeah. He says, well, how big is the image compared to the object? Did it get bigger? Did it get smaller? Did it, you know... And so these two equations can ask, wh where is the image? So in other words, is it close or far? And how big is the image? And of course, I'll follow him along with timeline and say it's negative of the image distance over object distance. And I can't help but feel like I got to show you a little bit of the of the proof. You can you can see that if you take a triangle, I'll label the triangle in orange. So see how this triangle has object distance and object height? And then this triangle also, um, that's probably not a good triangle to do. My apologies. Well, um, it's, it's a set of triangles. And this triangle and this triangle. Yeah, I better stop with the proof. We did, so if we get two sets of triangles, we'll say they're similar, we can compare them, we can have two equations, and if we did all the math in between, we would get this equation. 
So what I want to do is examples for you and say, okay, how am I going to use this? And this is the key. So anytime we have a lens, we could go ahead and with two equations, we could then solve for two unknowns. Usually, if you look at there, there's four unknowns. Uh, there's the object distance, the image distance, the focal length, and the magnification. And usually what's given is the focal length of the lens and the position of the object. And then the question is, where's the image and how big is the image? And so we need to know those two. Where is it and its magnification? So by taking this equation together with this equation, we can usually answer that question. Where are, is the image located? What does it look like to us? And they can be very interesting here because way, the way I've drawn it, I would say that I've drawn it that the image looks almost the same size as the object. But I'm hoping you can kind of visualize if, I, if this was further out, and you can see it in the math. If that number got bigger, then that number would have to get smaller in order to always equal the same number, a constant. And so what would happen is this would move closer in and get smaller. So we would have an upside down small image. And I think that's what you saw in that drawing here of the person, yeah. And so the person's kind of tall, but the image is upside down and pretty short. And this would be like taking a, a camera picture of somebody. You, you know the person's, you know, five to six feet tall, and then they're going to make a little image then on the CCD array of your camera, and that's, you know, kind of how that picture is. Maybe here's a better picture of, a, of the light coming into a camera. We've got this tall person here, the, they have the light from the feet going up here and the light from the head going down here and so the image if you will is upside down but who cares we don't really see the image we just make a you know photograph of it um, but there is the image upside down. So sometimes they can be upside down, but sometimes they can be right side up, too. Or watch this one. This one might be harder to kind of comprehend. Let me take, and I'll draw this in blue again here. Uh, what if, and I'll put a focal point here and a focal point here. What if the person is closer than the focal point? And you'll see why I did this one second, because it's much harder to draw this one, but let me give it a try. I'll draw the, the first rays, and so I'll do the red one here. So the red one says, okay, a beam that's coming parallel, and maybe I better put a center line here, so something to compare it to. This beam would come down and go through the focal point. Now, this one is interesting because remember the second one I've drawn, which your author calls number three, is kind of hard to draw. So, number two is not too bad. Maybe I'll do number two first like he does. All right, so number two goes through the center of the lens. But see how these two never meet? Now, number three, which I drew in green, so I'll do it over here, would be the one that goes through the focal point. But if I draw a ray that goes from my object to my focal point, it never goes to the lens. And so we kind of change our thinking and say, well, draw the ray that goes to the lens as if it came through the focal point. And so it doesn't really go through the focal point, but it has that same angle, so the physics comes out to be the same. 
and I didn't draw my lens big enough, so I'm going to make a taller lens here. But if I draw the ray here, it's going to go parallel. And so those would be the three beams. And like I said, these three are probably easier to see than these three. However, did you notice that all of these aren't coming together? What your author calls beam one, beam two, and beam three. However, if you ask what would somebody on this side perceive? These three beams would be perceived as coming from right here. So it's still going to make an image. But the image is bigger. The image is right side up. The image is not on this side of the lens where the light really goes. The image is on this side of the lens. In other words, it'll look like it's coming from here, but it didn't really come from here. That's the same thing we did with that flat mirror yesterday, right? When you look in a flat mirror, it looks like the light comes from inside of the mirror. You know it didn't really, you know it bounced off. But it's going to have that same appearance. And in fact, this is why I guess for you guys in class anyways, I can't really do it for you guys online, but I'll pass around a lens. Because if you take this big lens and you look at these two options, and your author calls this case number one and case number two, and says, all right, case number one, get something far away. And so I'll kind of ask you to kind of hold this and look at something far away. Like that fire extinguisher for me is pretty far away. So I'll go, oh, yeah, look at that fire extinguisher. And I can see that fire extinguisher, and it looks like it's coming from right here. It looks like it's upside down. But if I look at something close within the focal length, so I say I'll look at this little box here. Oh, that looks bigger. It looks right side up. And so, okay. And that's kind of that different effect depending on where that lens is, if you guys want to play with that a little bit. But those are two important cases. Here's some good news for you, though. both of these equations still work. Except, and hopefully you can see it in the picture, mathematically, our image distance will be a negative number. And so let me point out when the image distance is less than zero, we're talking about a situation like this. We're talking about a situation where the light didn't really go. Over here, we're talking about an image distance that is greater than zero. For clarity then, we like to call this a real image. And part of that name, real image, is because the image is formed where the light really went. Where did the right light really go? It went through the lens. And the image is formed on this side of the lens. The image is formed where the light really went. It's a real image. This one, the light never was really here. It's still an image. It still has that appearance of coming from here. So we call it a virtual image. And I suppose the name's not really important except for note then that what's nice about these two scenarios and what's going to be nice about the homework is you've got the same equation. In fact, what's really nice here is you can see the magnification. If both these numbers are positive with the negative in front, like right here, you're going to get an upside down image. This is going to give you a negative. However, if as in this scenario, your image distance is a negative number. 
Then over here, you will have the negative of a negative number. That makes a positive. And so your magnification is positive, meaning it's not inverted, it's erect. And so cases like this, we have a positive magnification. We say it's non-inverted or erect. But over here, we would say, well, it's inverted. It's a real image. It's inverted. Its magnification is negative. And so these are the two big options we can get for this type of lens. And it gets better. Yeah. If you were to add another lens, like for <gasps> picture, yeah. Because isn't that the same same angles as the first? Would it reverse the image and erect it? Yeah, so um, de depending where you put the lens, but yeah, so if I put a lens here, uh, the way we would treat a second lens is just to say forget about the original object and forget there's a lens here just pretend this is your object now so in other words the image of the first one becomes the object for the second lens because all the light is coming from right here as if this was an object that's why somebody standing over here would call it an image because it looks just like an object with the light but it's, that's really not where the object is and so we could yeah we could do a chain of lenses we could go one other lens another lens and a lens and a lens and so the image of the lens before now becomes the object of the next one and as you said this would invert it again mm -hmm. all right now the other thing I need to show you then is what would happen and I want to leave this up here as a picture maybe I'll give myself a little more chalkboard room here what would happen if the glass was shaped a little different in what we call a concave pattern. And so I'll show you this one. I'm going to come over here and put it in here. Now I guess I don't have too much curvature to it, but if I power down the lights, can you see that the light spreads out? And so I guess you might say, well, that's not a focal point, is it? Well, I'm going to say it kind of is. I'm going to say that if you trace these rays back, they kind of appear to be coming from right here. they kind of look like they're spreading out from this point. And so it's, it's not a real focal point, so we'll call it a virtual focal point. And of course, it too would have one on each side. You can spin it around and get the same effect. And so we're still going to come over here and say, this lens has a focal point and it has one on each side and so if you were to put an object here and draw the rays ray number one which I've been drawing in red would go like this it would come here and then it would bend outward as if it was coming from there. Now, ray number two, which I've been doing in black, so I'll do that one, is the one that would go right through the center. I guess I should have done a center line. No bending at all. Now, maybe the hardest one to draw is this green one. 
and it, it, it was kind of hard here. You had to go through the focal point and then go straight. That wasn't too bad. This was kind of hard because if you drew it through the focal point, it never hit the lens. So instead, we drew it as if it had that same angle as coming from the focal point and then went straight. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. So here, what do we do? And I guess I'd say, I've already used that focal point. Let's use that one. And so if I take this green one, and if I was drawing a line or array that was headed towards this focal point, but then when it hits this lens, it goes parallel. Ah, that's the reverse. And so this green one is the reverse of the red one, right? The red one starts parallel and then deviates out. The green one is deviating in and then goes straight. Well, again, if you look at all three of these rays, you will notice that on this side, which I'm going to call case three, copy your answer, uh, or copy your, your author, that's what he does, he, he lists the three cases. He says this too, the light never meets over here. So you never have the, the easiest one to understand. You never have a, a, a real image. You have something kind of like this, where the light where it really goes doesn't meet and spread out. It appears to have been spreading out from someplace over on this side of the land. And so I would say, if you trace these back, it kind of looks like the light's coming from right there. And so this would be our image. And I, guess I will call it a virtual image also, because again, the light never really did gather there and deviate, it just appears to be deviating from there. But I am going to put the same math on the board and say, here's some good news for you. It doesn't matter whether you have a concave lens or a convex lens, you're going to do these same two sets of equations. However, there is one little subtlety here. Not only is the image distance less than zero, uh, we know that, we accept that. That, that, that is the discussion we had in case number two. But for this math to work, we also have to say the focal length is less than zero. And hence the name, I called it a virtual focal length. And so I would say there's some good news, bad news here about the lenses. The good news is it's the same set of equations. That's great. The bad news is you got to pay attention to those negative signs. But yet at the same time, I think that's some good news. Because what that can mean is if you do a calculation and they, you, know, you don't know what kind of lens it is and you do a calculation and you come up with a negative, you now know it's a concave, I mean, yeah, concave lens. Or if you do a calculation and it comes out positive, then you know it's convex. Or if you do a calculation and you get image distance and if you get a positive number, then you know it's over here. And it's a positive number. But if you get a negative number, then you know it's on the virtual side. And so the math can actually be helpful. Very helpful. And that's what I wanted to, to warn you about here. Now, maybe in the time we have left, I should point out that the mirrors do the same thing. And then let's do a few examples in whatever time we have left. And maybe I'll make some other virtual uh, or additional uh, videos here of this. But if you take a mirror that is shaped 
this way. The light will come in and spread out. And so what I'm trying to say is a convex mirror behaves just like a concave lens. Uh, you, you might even see this if I take a convex mirror and I put it in this beam here. I'll power down the lights and put it in there. And see how it reflects the light and makes it spread out. And it kind of looks like the light beams come from this point right there. And so I'm going to put a little F right here. Now, of course, there is one thing dramatically different between the mirror and the lens. The lens, of course, the light went through. <laughs> the mirror, the light bounces off. But I want to convince you then that a concave mirror could act just like these and a convex mirror can act just like this lens. And I'm going to say the same thing. Here's some really good news. Same set of equations. And if it spreads the light out, we'll call F less than zero. And if it makes a virtual image, we'll call the image distance less than zero. Now, maybe I better do my drawings and start with the easy one here. In fact, maybe I should show you a concave mirror shape. And so here is the concave mirror. If I power down the room lights and put it here, uh, maybe I'll even angle it so you can see it coming up at first. But then I'll twist it back so it goes kind of back on itself. But you can see how it makes the light converge. And so the behavior of this mirror, a concave mirror, has the same behavior as a convex lens. So that's why we put them in the same category and say, okay, the images formed by mirrors and the images formed by lenses are really the same. The only hard part is try to remember concave goes with convex. <laughs> they switch roles. All right. Uh, so again, if I was trying to draw this, I would put a focal point here. And so again, hopefully what I'm about to draw seems to match. But I, I guess I should also say that there is an important difference in that the mirror reflects where the lens lets the light go through. You might say then that there's only one focal length, but I would say the light goes by the focal length on the way in, hits the mirror, and goes by the focal length on the way out. So in that sense, it really is like the lens. The light comes in and goes by one focal length, or focal point, then it hits the lens, and then it goes by another focal point. So the lens has two of them because the light you know, never goes back onto itself. But we can really then think of this as two, and we can draw our rays. Uh, for example, let me just put my object right there. Let me grab my red marker and draw 
the ray that is parallel and the ray that will parallel goes in and bounces off and goes through the focal point. That was the whole meaning of the focal point. Now, what your author calls ray number three, which I'll draw in green, this is the harder of the two, actually of the three, is it goes through the focal point first, then hits the lens. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go through the focal point first, then hit the mirror. And then when it hits the mirror, remember this is the reverse, so it's going to go parallel. And I'll say it again, you don't have to draw all three rays, because once you know where two of them meet, all of them meet, and so this would be the image. Now, if I go ahead and I draw the third one, which on here I drew it in black, so I'll draw it on black to match, it would hit the center and that point at the center would be like a little flat mirror, so it would just bounce off. And so I'm hoping that when I draw this, it looks a lot like this to you. The only difference is the light here goes through the lens whereas here it bounces off. But I am going to say that it's the same set of equations that work for everything also work for this concave mirror. And uh, this would be a real image. The light really does go there. Now, maybe I should show you this one. This one's kind of fun to see because images like this aren't as common to us. We are common for images where they're virtual. We usually look in a flat mirror and we say the image is inside of the mirror. We don't usually say something like this where the image is close to us. The image is in front of the mirror. Or in this lens, if you were standing here, you would say the image is near me. I mean, there's the object way over there. There's the lens way over there. But there's the image. And it, it gives it kind of a ghostly appearance. And so this one's kind of fun to do because you can see the original object. And as it shakes around in there, you can then see the image. And you can even then see as I shake it and the object changes position, the image changes position. And when the object moves in, so the image, or the object distance is shorter, the image moves out. Now I don't know if you can tell, there is a slight magnification. When it moves out, it looks bigger and moves in, it looks smaller. And so there is some magnification effects of this. And because of that, I think it's really easy to tell which one is the image and which one is the, the object. But I'm hoping you'll see that it looks like the image is right here. It's not in the mirror or behind the mirror. It's out in front of the mirror. And so real images are just different. We're not, we're not used to them. We're used to the virtual images, the ones that are inside of the mirror. That's most of our experience. Now, maybe I should try to draw these other ones uh, real quick so that they, they match here. Uh, let me come over here and say, all right, I've got my, my mirror over here. Um, let's say here's the center line. Uh, let's say here's the focal point. Let me put my object closer to the mirror than the focal point. That's what we did for this lens. And let me draw my three rays. And I guess the first ray would go parallel and through the focal point. The second one is the one that just hits the mirror and is un deviated. The third one, and always a hard one to draw, the green one here, if you remember, 
we had to draw it as if it was coming from the focal point. So I will do it here and say draw it as if it's coming from the focal point, and then it would go straight. And hopefully you'll notice the same effect here. Except for the fact that the light reflects, these three lines never meet out here. They appear to meet over here. And so I would get an image, which I guess I should probably draw in black, that appears to be coming from right here. And so here's my image. There's my virtual image. It appears to be behind the mirror. And it appears to be bigger. And that's exactly what we said here. And here again, it's some good news. That you can use the same set of equations for all these cases. The only thing you might need to remember here is we're going to be talking about an image distance that is negative. The image distance is always negative when it's where the light doesn't really go. It just appears to come from it. So for the mirror, that would be behind the mirror. For the lens, that would be in the front of the lens because the light went to the back of the lens. And if the image is formed on the front of the mirror, the image is being formed where the light didn't go. And so a virtual image is always where the light didn't go. A real image is formed where the light really is. And real images, the image distance is positive. But for virtual images, the image distance is negative. And so if there's anything tough about these, it's keeping track of positives and negatives. Okay. And in fact, I can kind of show you this one because I have a nice big concave mirror right here. And maybe if I step back and you look at yourself in this, you will be a scenario kind of where this is way out here and the image is upside down and small. And so hopefully that's what you see in this. You see yourself and you see yourself upside down or maybe further back. Maybe you see something far away like Ron over there in the camera. You see Ron upside down. Of course, I got to get the angle right for people to see that. Okay. But if I put something close, something within the focal length. And so maybe like this red marker, you will see it, if I get the angle right, can you see me? You'll see it bigger, right side up. And it'll have the appearance of being over here by me, further, further away than the mirror, and further away than the, than the object, as we, the camera people can see it. And, you know. And so that's the, that effect. Uh, now I have to wrap up. Looks like I didn't get a chance to do any example calculations, but I will add that to the video here. But let me draw this one. Let me draw these rays. And so this one, I'll call it ray number one, is the easy one to draw. Kind of. There's nothing easy about the diverging one. And so remember, the concave lens is the same as the convex mirror. But it would bounce off as if it was coming from the focal point. See, that's what we did with this red one. It comes through parallel and diverts out. Uh, let me draw the green one. The green one would be the one that comes in towards this focal point. And if the mirror wasn't here, it would exactly hit this point. But then it bounces off and goes parallel. And the black one is the one that is just kind of undeviated. Uh, what your author calls ray number two will bounce off and go this way. But again, hopefully you can see that this red, green, and black one never meet up. This is going to give you a virtual image. And so it will appear to have come from. And appear. Oh, here it is to be coming from right here. And so this will make a smaller right side up image. And if I turn this one around, you'll 
see that if you kind of look at yourself. Or if I grab this one here, which is our convex lens, and you look out, you, you can see yourself in the room. And everything in here is right side up but smaller. In some sense, this lens is kind of boring because no matter what you look at, everything is right side up and smaller. This one can actually be interesting because it can make things upside down. It can make them smaller. It can make them uh, bigger. In fact, these are the kind you see as cosmetic mirrors, right? They magnify your face. These are the ones you see at the dentist. It's got a little dimple in it. It's got that little round thing and the doctor shoves it in your mouth and moves it around and it, it magnifies it. It's curved in. And so it's kind of this scenario where you see a virtual image and it's further away and it's, it's magnified. This one is one that you can see has the advantage of seeing a wide angle. And so you'll often put this when you're driving a car, it'll be on the passenger side mirror. Because the nice thing is you can get a big angle, you can see your bl blind spot. The bad thing is it makes everything look smaller. That's why when you look in it, it's hard to tell where the car is. That's why there's a little writing under there. It says objects are closer than they appear. Uh, these are the kind you see in dressing rooms, or at least ladies dressing rooms, because it'll make you look thinner and make you look smaller. And so they'll curve it this way. They don't curve it this way so you don't look shorter, but it's more like a cylinder instead of a sphere. And so you'll be curved this way and you stand in front of that mirror and you look thinner this way, but you look the same height that way. And so then you buy the outfit. That's why they put it in the dressing room. So if you'll try it on and look at yourself. And so they, these mirrors can give an interesting effect. Well, I guess we have to stop here. But I wrote down a bunch of examples and so I will add to this example 36, 40, 47, 54, and 57. And those are these calculations that would be the end of the chapter. And so we'll do one more day on optics. I'm not sure what to do, but we won't cover everything of the next two chapters. I'll pick some bits and pieces and we'll just do one more day on optics and then move on. Oh, and dispersion. I'll show you dispersion tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're, we're out of time. We got to let the next class in here. Yeah.